Welcome to Accelerator and this uh, symposium, which is part of Accelerator's art and uh, research program. Uh, my name is Richard Julen. I am the artistic director of Accelerator. And together with Therese Schellner, uh, I've curated the exhibition, The Experimental Field, which is the starting point for this symposium. Uh, before I'll hand over to Bronwyn Bailey Charteris in a moment, uh, I wanna share some words about this exhibition with you. And uh, I'm now here in the, the exhibition spaces of uh, Accelerator uh, on the campus of Stockholm University. Uh, which is located just north of Stockholm's city center in the Royal National City Park. Uh, in 1816, the experimental field was established here by the Royal Swedish Academy of Agri uh, Agriculture and Forestry. And in essence, uh, this was the birthplace of modern Swedish farming. Uh, the activities here and the name Experimental Field has given name to this first group show of Accelerator. And uh, we, as a parenthesis, we opened here in these spaces late 2019. So uh, in relation to this historic starting point, uh, we've invited eight contemporary artists and groups of artists who are interested in contemporary themes in relation to this history. And uh, to name uh, the central themes that, that we uh, took as a starting points uh, based on what the art artists are doing, uh, the relations we humans have to other species, how we relate to nature, and also certain aspects of human interaction among ourselves and not least in this crisis in which uh, we partly developed the exhibition. And uh, one of those aspects that we thought were uh, very interesting is uh, the relation between urban and rural areas. This exhibition is open until the 19th of September, but we're gonna take a little summer break. Uh, so please visit our homepage for more information. Uh, and you can also find a number of uh, other recorded talks in relation to this exhibition on our website that have been given in relation to the exhibition and uh, lots of other material uh, around the show. Uh, and of course, if you have the possibility, uh, we encourage you uh, to uh, visit us here. And also, if you can, to walk, take a walk to Accelerator. Uh, on our webpage, we have a lot of suggestions for different paths to take here and things you can do uh, while you walk to come here and visit us. And I want to round up by just wishing everyone a rewarding symposium today. And I'm handing over to you, uh, Bronwyn. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very, very much. Welcome, everybody. I I um, echo you, Richard, in welcoming everybody to the Soil Symposium um, and also for the introduction to the exhibition of the experimental field. Um, as Ricard said, my name is Bronwyn Bailey Charteris um, and I have the pleasure of being the curator and moderator of the Soil Symposium today. And I'll be guiding us through this afternoon of program. Um, and here at Accelerator, I am the project leader for uh, Art and Research. And over the past two years or so, um, I've had the pleasure of working with curator Therese Schellner and artistic director Richard Julian and the whole team here at Accelerator to craft the Art and Research program. And so at Accelerator, um, art encounters research in this interdisciplinary dialogue on contemporary issues and challenges. And our aim with this program is to foster the exchange of knowledge and reflections on how art and science address current societal issues based on their respective disciplines. And so the program provides a platform for interdisciplinary dialogue and enables exploration of new types of knowledge and ways of discussing research through art which is exactly what we're gonna try and do today. Um, and today is a little bit of an experiment, um, which is fitting for the experimental field. It's our first ever symposium for Accelerato. Um, and we're very excited for this kind of cross-disciplinary meeting place for artists and researchers to discuss the matter, memories and futures of soil. 
The um, starting point of today's uh, soil symposium within the exhibition experimental field is the work of Swedish art and agricultural group Cultivata, who are here with us in this room, or parts of are here with us in this Zoom room today. Um, and we're going to share parts of their commission for the experimental field, which is called the Soil Faculty, um, which you can, yes, which we'll kind of this, we're using as kind of a departure point for today's um, symposium. Um, and a few, but to, before we get into that, just a few very small practical things for the afternoon. We're going to be live streaming here on YouTube. And so hello to anybody who's working, watching us live and hello to anyone who's watching us in the future. <laughs> um, so you can feel free to come and go as you like. It's a four hour program. Um, and in the last half an hour, we will be having a group kind of panel discussion between artists and researchers. Um, and during this conversation, you'll be welcome to contribute with questions on the YouTube chat. We will try to make that technically work. Um, so if you would like to be part of the conversation there, that will be the time for that. Um, and as I said, this is a bit of an experiment, thank, but thank you so much for joining us in this journey into the matters of soil. Um, and today's program features researchers and artists and artistic researchers from Stockholm University and beyond. And you can follow the full program on the website or otherwise you can just follow along and I'll make sure that you know who's speaking when and all these kind of things as well. I also want to just do a little shout out to this digital background that I am enmeshed in today. Um, this is a background that's crafted by artist Emily Person and it's especially made for the Soil Symposium. Um, and the piece is called Nematodes Nematodes and is made in collaboration with the minerals that form soil and the minerals that form computers. Later on in the program, we will see a uh, longer work by Emily around the hybridity of material relations between computers and soils as well. So now let's get started. <laughs> I want to begin by welcoming Marlon Lindmark Fierman and Matu Fierman, uh, the artists who are here representing the group Cultivopter. Sorry, I said your last name completely. <laughs> I got really excited about the, um, about the sounds. <laughs> But you're so welcome and um, I would just love to welcome you here and it's actually we are here together at Accelerato so we are but we're spacing ourselves out to be COVID friendly um, but to begin with just a few words about Cultivato. So Cultivato is an experimental collaboration of organic farming and visual art practice and they're situated in the rural village of Dystad on the island of Erland on the southeast coast of Sweden. And so by installing certain functions in abandoned farm faculties close to the active agricultural community, Cultivata provides a meeting and working space that exposes the parallels between provision production and art practice, between concrete and abstract processes for survival. And as I said, Cultivata has produced the commission soil faculty um, for the experimental field. Um, and it's this that we're going to hear about today in this presentation, um, along with some of the older works that have led in towards this newer work being made as well. So I'm going to hand the word over to you both. Um, and yeah, we can discuss, discuss your work with Cultivata and also the soil faculty and also the wonderful red earthworms, Lumbricus rubellus, who are your collaborators in this particular work as well. So welcome. Thank you Bromwin, thank you and uh, thank you for having us here. It's so nice to finally be here in uh, person. We have been talking mostly over screens the last months. We have, we have definitely. It's lovely to just be in the same room for a moment. Yeah, it's wonderful. And to see how, how well the worms have been taken care of. I think they like this bridge base. Um, and uh, like you said, Bronwyn, we will start to uh, just give a background of Cultivator, how we started and some of the things we have been doing uh, since then. So I will share my screen to um, show this. Good. Now I'll take the screen and then, then we can go to the internet later. Yeah. And then to the 
So you see it now good? The, everybody the screen? Yes. Yes. So um, here is actually the text that uh, Bronwyn just uh, read to us. And next to it, you see our logo that tries to combine these different things that we find so interesting and important. The agriculture, the art, uh, and uh, all the life that comes around it. Cultivator uh, started in 2005. We uh, moved then, me and Mathieu, that has an art uh, background, moved to the small village, Dyestad, on the southeast coast of Sweden, and uh, met up with the farmers, uh, Marie Elin, Mark and Henrik Stigeborn. We put these two images next to each other because they are quite funny. Here we have two uh, on drawing and a sketch of Vincent van Gogh depicting farmers, and here we have Mia and Henrik working. So Henrik has a small organic dairy farm with 30 cows and Mia is working with vegetables uh, growing and she still is even though she has her own farm now in the village. Uh, the cows uh, are of course an important uh, player in our community. Here you can see them uh, outside in our field and uh, us working. So this farm is a commercial farm. It supports Henrik. So it's not uh, it's not just an experiment. It is a farm practice on his family farm that he inherited from his parents and grandparents. And we are working with farm practices interwoven and sometimes uh, totally separated from the farm of Henrik. Well, what was it that made us start this thing? We came to the countryside, leaving the urban center of Amsterdam. Uh, I think our first instinct was to get more space. And uh, what we realized when we started to get to know the surroundings and get to know all the get to know the, the practice of the farm was that these are incredibly interesting and vital things for community and for life and at that point this was in 2004 when we moved there we did not experience a lot of interest from the art world where we were in that we came from into these things and we were also not uh, we did not know uh, uh, so much about farming, the politics behind farming, all the rules and regulations and and the whole uh, ecosystem uh, connections that are at, at play. So when, when we, the more we realized, the more we saw that this is a very, uh, this is an important work that is being done. And we also need to look into this with the eyes of art and culture because we felt that there was a separation between uh, farming as it is today and the uh, art as it was uh, then. Yes. So, um, yeah, we have had a bit of a farming mentality towards projects. So we will try to give you a very select uh, group of works because we have been working a lot. But through the years, you can say that we did what our name says to experiment with this concept. So. 15 years of experimenting led to uh, about 130 guest artists at our place uh, from uh, 30 different countries. It's also researchers or organizers or farmers. And then we also work as a group, an art group where we do interventions. And throughout the years, we have been working quite a lot internationally. Also, we had easier to actually get work done somewhere else than in Sweden, uh, where they wanted us to see how can art help with the rural urban question. And one of these earlier questions was in 2007, then we were asked to do an, uh, an exhibition at the W139 in the Amsterdam Red Light District. It's one of the oldest art run initiatives. And uh, of course, to combine art and agriculture at our place is uh, very easy because we have a farm. But how do you combine that in the city? And one thing that we also wanted to do is that there's so much decision being made about the countryside without people from the countryside being there. 
and part of it. So we decided different things within this show, which we call supermodel. Uh, one was that we let farmers come to the center with all the machines necessary for hay and deliver a hay bale. Um, this was done without permission, so that uh, left some discussions with the police, but they thought that we were rolling. Uh, now you see here the tractors coming, but it is to literally invade then the city with the countryside to start talking about the producers of our food and uh, to connect this. And one example was one when we were rolling this hay bale to the art space, the police stopped us and thought it was marijuana, which was, of course, then you could see they just couldn't associate this with hay. So they, they, they took the only thing nearest. And yeah, who rolls this amount? It's hilarious. Um, well, there was a lot of interactions uh, because you can say a bit also considering the worms that we like to see ourselves like this, cultivating both physically, but also socially, the ground to see if new uh, stuff can grow forward. Uh, and this is there you see calf iglos. Uh, this is where calves are brought up in, uh, also in Sweden a lot. Then we asked kids to redesign them like they wanted. And yeah, to, a lot of the work that we do, of course, is to put stuff in another context. What if worms are at an art space? And what does that do with the discussion? And, to research that and we invited also El Parche, the art group um, that uh, works a lot with the questions of the Colombian and also the war on drugs and what it did. And you see here hanging an, a rapeseed oil press, which we have at our farm. Also a bit to show the creativity and the ease of creativity that small scale farming have to solve solutions. So we kind of just asked the farmer, we want a rapeseed oil press build it and then we pressed the oil which we also used to drive in in the old days 25 percent in our diesel cars and we sold and like gave them away as molotov cocktails um yeah we jump to the next yes and this is another project that is called uh, the right to farm the land and here we are on the land so the previous project was in a in an art gallery but then we got a question from a farmer one of the biggest landowners in south of sweden that had a hectare of land uh, over and he uh, asked us if we could make an artistic intervention on this piece of land that's 10000 square meters that he just had over and that's quite uh, uh, remarkable but for the modern day farming with this huge machines that have to run very fast such a small plot of land of 10,000 square meters is not even worth driving to so it was not uh, that he gave up something but he he asked us to do something there we uh, realized that this plot of land was very close to a suburb of uh, Krihansta, where a lot of people live that newly arrived to Sweden from Iraq or Somalia and other countries. They did not have access to land. They did not really have access to the country they came to either. So right to farm the land is a play with the word where in Swedish the word land can mean both the ground and the soil you're standing on and also the country or the nation you are in. So what we did was to open up a small office in this uh, uh, neighborhood where people lived. And we invited them to come and talk about farming and growing vegetables, asking what experience they had with it. And then we handed out plots. So here you see a, a line of people on the ground itself. And we just divided uh, the land into small plots and gave it to anyone that wanted to grow vegetables on it. Uh, it was a super nice project, uh, not totally appreciated uh, from the, I think the landowner had a slightly different idea. And also the people that came there, okay, they wanted to grow vegetables, but they also needed land to do other things, like this oven that this Iraqi fam family did out of clay. They could not make that if they would have been in the urban uh, setting where they were placed in Sweden, but here they could make an oven 
and they could open a small bakery with a special bread that they could not find in Kristianstad at the time. So the mother made these uh, breads in the tent and then they were baked on the walls of the special oven and given to, they could give that to people. So that was one, um, one project on the land. Yeah, and I think they're also important that we have seen that a lot also at our farm working with refugees is that to allow them to be in the land, to be part of it and part of the history that it shaped it. So the clay of the oven is probably left and maybe the grandkids will talk about it or, you know, this is like giving access both to animals and humans to the land. Um, yeah, and then this kind of in between, but maybe good to could be an idea with mixing researchers and artists like you did. We got to question then to make a uh, conference about uh, art and agriculture. So how, how do we fuse and let work together with, uh, but this hanged also together to see how we can define this new field, which is not very new, but this field within arts. And it was the question that came from literal in the Lake District, an organization to see, can we work on these fields, different organizations in Europe, define ourselves before the art critics do it and maybe kill it. Um, and we thought that was fascinating, but then came to the conclusion that conferences are a bit boring and uh, a wedding is better. And also that takes up all these questions. How do we are, how do we go into a relationship with each other? What are, which uh, ancestors should we invite or a family should we invite? Uh, so we made an office in the Kalma Art Museum. Also good to use art spaces as a process uh, tool instead of uh, an exhibition space. And research this uh, together with the public and, and all the people invited to see how do we make this wedding happen? Uh, and then you go, of course, a step further than just say, how do we work together? Is how do you have a relationship together? Which is, I think, a word. So we made a tree from the, an, uh, what is it called? Family tree. A family tree where people could blister in whatever they thought, like Van Gogh and who should be where placed, how far are they away? Can they sit around the same table or will it be fights? Um, well, here we see. Fiona Woods, an, an Irish uh, artist and curator that has a group similar to Cultivator in Ireland. And she came to add some uh, people on this family tree that she thought would be relevant for the party later. Yeah, and discussions for then it was still exciting to have video discussions with, in this case, uh, Brownwin for New York and Australia. So we made a good joke to do it upside down where we took up the concept of uh, can we apply open source philosophy to land, which I think still is very relevant, especially nowadays. Shouldn't we change who can own land by who is productive for the land uh, in a way? Uh, we were also uh, preparing the wedding in an ornamental way. So what you see here is a facade on something that will become a kitchen back home in our farm. You see some of the cutlery and porcelain that was also specially designed by artists for the wedding dinner. You see Eric Hudin, an artist that is on this ladder photographing his small pond of Asola, uh, that is a special water firm that he uh, encountered when he looked into NASA's research on what kind of food you can grow on space journeys. So this experimental food was made uh, you see also the very old fashioned, uh, borrowed from the historical museum wedding dress, uh, actually used in a farm wedding close to our village. So we mixed a bit of these uh, things. We were also growing food in the art museum in preparation. And uh, there you see this on the farm again, the kitchen is built and here we are cooking together as a big family, the artists and the farmers and um, yeah. There is a, a documentary about it that, that kind of felt like in the end God didn't want this marriage to happen. So the Tate modern curators are putting plastic on all the windows while the rain is pouring down and trees fell. So it got a bit of a feeling, but we're still alive. So it maybe. 
And this is a group from Latvia, uh, Serde, that also has a rural initiative. So they gave us this home brew machine as a wedding present. And they have been doing, within other things, cultural heritage research on uh, vodka making in the villages of Latvia. So they were one of the guests and one of the parts of the formal network that this wedding created of European and some out of Europe uh, organizations that work with art and agriculture. Yeah. And this was the wedding wow that we uh, designed together. We draw it on this white cow and it just says, I promise to give you what you need. And if we could do that mutually with the land, the animals and also uh, the whole ecosystems, we would come much further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is another work where we are moving some farm into the urban or the suburban. <coughs> this is Fitja in uh, Stockholm. And we are taking part in Fitja Open. That was a festival art happening uh, arranged by Botkyrka Konsthall. And we set up <coughs> a, a chicken coop outside one of the high-rise building blocks and next to the open cafe that you can see on this image. The cafe is stretching into one of the apartments on the ground floor. So the window is open to the kitchen and the American group open restaurants. We're collecting recipes and making food and bread that people could buy and share at this restaurant. And then you could throw the leftovers into our chickens. The chickens was uh, a great success with the children in the area that took care of them perfectly with great engagement in giving them food and also finding the eggs uh, when they came out in this little box. And for all animal friends, uh, we are also animal friends and the chicken were not disturbed inside their coop. So they were kind of protected from this big uh, love that they had from all the surrounding kids. Here is a guy preparing a nest for his egg and hoping he could make it hatch uh, at home. Yeah, very interesting. We will come into that more also with the worms and everything that uh, the intense engagement of people when you introduce animals into the factor or like nature, because they're really trying to dare get the locals involved in the art pieces, but it's difficult. But chickens made them insane. So the chickens were okay, but when we tried to remove the chickens, then there were seven kids like trying to pull down all the tools that we were busy with and threatening to kill them if we take them home. But yeah, but now uh, we're slowly getting into worms then. So this is one of the compost, the chicken coop, and we have worked with a lot of different kind of compost things, both compost toilets and uh, tombalas and did interventions in cities. But this one uh, we repeated, we almost never repeat, but uh, this one we do. Uh, we call it guerrilla composting or feedback. It's also a bit of a result of that when we begin, in the beginning we were very much part of this guerrilla gardening and so on. But of course the movement is growing very quick. And then we came a bit to this thing that also we need to take care of these places that we have put guerrilla plants and so on. So then we came up with this guerrilla composting which is then we did it in Berlin, in Belgrade and in Norway and some other place in different forms. But it all comes down to uh, the worm tower, it's called. It's kind of, you can just Google it. It's a concept where you have a, pit, a pipe which you put in the ground near to the plant that you would like to nourish extra. And there you put the worms in with extra goodies. And then the worms, of course, eat from the pipe and then shit in nearity of your plant. And what we did was we give tools to make these pipes and then give away the worms if they put them in the public. Uh, this one were actually the best one was the one when we made it in paper, of course, so it could really just go with the nature. But then we went quick. Uh, yeah, so that is uh, the project that I think really made us uh, fall in love with the worms and start to research and become amazed by the wonderful work they are doing uh, and also our way of working to uh, to see how we can combine activism 
and one of them is to just start spreading worms. So in case we don't mention it later, just have a little box at home with some uh, water and uh, like uh, the good, it's very easy to Google, there's very much and uh, it doesn't smell. So we can all start producing soil. Uh, how are we in time? Good. Right. So then... Um, I have to jump in there and say one of the kind of benefits of COVID for me from being privileged enough to be able to work from home was that I got to start my worm farm and my compost mm -hmm. at home. And I started it with the local park because I live in an apartment and my children and the other children in the, you know, who enjoy this park are obsessed with the worms. They take them and put them on the back of the trolley while they're riding around on their <laughs> bikes and move constantly move them between different compost piles and, Yes, hopefully no worms get damaged. But I just wanted to say as well, this kind of fascination with worms, it's so kind of visceral. And once you once you kind of dive into it, you can't really get away from them, I find. Mm. No, it started, it, grow, it grows on you. It and it's growing. Like in Germany, we saw farmers that quit with cows and now produce worms that you can have because you can post order it also in Sweden. Mm. So if you want worms, just order. You get a paper baggage ham home, I mean. Mm. And, um, they're magnificent creatures. Anyway, yeah, they are magnificent, and they, they could also I mean they can, yeah, you know they they can eat uh, they can be so helpful also with all these big uh, horse stables that uh, are surrounding our big cities with all the manure that is not really worked away. We could use worms to to actually eat that uh, much faster than than what is now because. Well, the next project, the next animal, that is also something that we are crazy about, uh, is the horse. And this is a, a project where we used the horse as a meeting area for people from different cultures. In 2016, we had this big amount of people coming from Syria, mostly to Erland because Erland has a lot of campings and a lot of empty beds so the migration authorities could could rent a lot of spaces so very many people came to Erland just because we had uh, beds empty beds and of course this was uh, occupying us and our minds and we thought about how to meet these new people and how to get to know each other and what could bind us together we made one project around bread that we shared the stories of bread in our different cultures and uh, the follow-up on that was the uh, meeting around the horse uh, the middle east has a very strong old horse culture horse tradition and we have one in sweden as well and on erland as well that was a horse island where a lot of horse breeding was going on and still is going on so we thought that the horse could be a great thing to meet around. On this image, you see uh, uh, Rames Omarin. He is a refugee that came. He is painting a poem on uh, one of our outdoor walls. This is an old Bedouin poem that is uh, more or less goes on about that. If you want to know me, you should ask my horse. And to the right, you see a still image from a video installation of Shiva Anushivani, where it, from a performance she made together with us in this project in uh, riding Manish, where she tries to play the piano with her hands cuffed. Um, Shiva was also one of the artists we invited to take part in this project, showing her film, um, The Tame and the White. That has that shows like how the horse world is not really accessible for the one that is not in this normative white middle class girl area. Uh, we want everything on Cultivata. We are very interested in making things accessible or sharing with other people that are not usually the horse uh, or getting to certain things. And on this image, you see our horse Barney, and he is pulling a carriage with the designer and architect Johan Karlsson, that was another invited artist to this project. He uh, made, he drew and made this uh, little carriage that is a carriage for an artist to drive around 
with the horse and look at the surroundings and make drawings of them. And it's called a charrette. A charrette is also a name for a quick sketch that you are using in, in design and architect world. This is an image from an installation from the third artist that we invited, Signe Johannesen. And Signe made a new production of a video piece called Thanks for Carrying, where she in this video is thanking especially one horse from her own uh, history, but also the horse uh, in general for carrying us, humanity, forward. And then also especially this one horse that she thanks for carrying her as a young uh, girl. Another part of New Horse Cultures was a study circle that I made together with women from the refugee centers around us. I invited them to come to the farm and to spend time with our horses and learn riding and horsemanship. And for them to come to the farm from the camps where they were sitting or the campings where they were, were sitting was, I think, already that was a kind of uh, relief, but also the meeting with these big animals and seeing that you can actually <clears throat> handle them and it's, it's not, um, uh, you can even ride a big horse over different obstacles and through nature. So in a way this, this work with the study circle was also uh, looking into uh, these ideas of power and, and uh, actually collaboration because it was not so much about mastering the horses as it was being friends with them and softly being able to direct and communicate with such a large animal. The New Horse Cultures project uh, ended in a big party. Here we see just an image from the horse disco out on our farm. So where everybody from the, mostly people from the refugee centers, but all, of course also other people came to celebrate with us when this was all done. I think this is the last slide from the New Horse Cultures. Um, after doing that project, I was uh, asked if I could present some of the experiences uh, from New Horse Cultures on a conference, multi-species storytelling that was given at the Linnaeus University. And then I thought that maybe the best one to talk about this would be my horse, Burberry. She did not take part in the study circle herself because she's a bit too... Uh, wild to, to handle, but she uh, was watching. So together with the curator of the conference, Ida Benke, I was, we were thinking about how could a horse present on a conference? How could we collaborate with her in a respectful way, not forcing her to do any tricks or forcing her into something uncomfortable? Um, that led us to the work of Karin Bolinder, an American artist and she has been working with microbes the small small microbes that are living everywhere inside us and outside us and also on our tongues this is an image of a petri dish where the small microbes uh, organisms that are on a tongue are cultivated and so they are taken from the tongue put onto the petri dish and when they are there, they start to move. So what these microbes are doing is that they are creating a kind of pattern, a map or a text, and somehow talking to us. So we set up a pre-conference to the big conference uh, on our farm. These are the dishes, the images, the mi microscope images of the petri dish are on real dishes. And we arranged for a meeting where we are eating oatmeal porridge, a few people and a few horses together, everybody licking on the same dishes and sharing everything that is living on our tongues. Also the cows took part in the licking. So here a, a cow is leaving some marks on one of the petri dishes. 
and this is a big uh, yeah, image of <coughs> what came out. So this talk, we called it Cultivating Mother Tongues. This talk about the uh, that we had around that table and when Burberry was sharing her experiences and all the other art uh, horses became images, you can say. And this image in the microscope you could see and you could follow that ongoing, slowly moving uh, conversation and storytelling from the university uh, conference. So this was sent there. And uh, from that much I will tell something about other uh, uh, I have to call uh, there. Can put it on other works the with the ecosystems around us that are very yeah. recent. And also I think taking up that more and more this fascination of maybe also using art to do real change because we have this space which we can use like uh, for here in small scale but anyway you have been composting with worms by us doing an art piece doing that and this is our uh, piece uh, that was of uh, this is from the local art projects uh, uh, local cons projects on status construct they asked us to suggest a uh, public art piece uh, and this is one of them because it became in the end three. This is also together with Signe Johansson, Erik Röhren and Trish Rowan, who is in Australia, where we made three different leaking monuments, you can say. In this case, this one, the one we made at our place is taking the grey water from our guest house and the rainwater, filtering it and uh, in the end going into a ditch. Um, which is there, the, 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 the monument is there for the insects and our apple trees and everything and taking up the leaking, which is a huge problem here, eh? the leaking of water, uh, like France loses 23% of it. But there is some animals that don't mind that so much. Uh, and starting to get very much into this concept, we can actually make objects that do make change at the same time as it still keeps art. We were talking about this before but also me personally i i'm not afraid to have function to art i don't understand really that fear um, uh, and this sorry led to um how do we do a whole screen again to uh, visa Uh, yeah, and this is another example then. We are still doing the finishing touch of it, but this is an Österjöd Lands Museum uh, at their park. We got this, uh, the public um, yeah, the public art uh, assignment to uh, make a piece there. And in this way, we chose to make a stream, which is uh, taking the day water of the museum and uh, making it go one more time so it gets open in the UV or in the sun which is very important for uh, cleaning the water. Nowadays, the new regulations will be that water should go in the air, um, leading to an, a drinking fountain, which also, of course, is a bit of a socialistic uh, uh, approach to uh, this ridiculousness of everybody buying water. And we took away this concept of just giving. So, and this would have taken ages by if we did this through bureaucracy and so on. But because it's art, we could immediately make these changes happen. So, um, which is an important and very, uh, we start to get more and more into this concept and talking also with other artists that we should use this empty space to help because we are too much in a hurry to let everything go too slow. Um, yeah, this leads a bit, but we will talk later about it more the project that we are now in the middle of. Uh, I'm just today have been researching the place. This is uh, Explorations of Now, which is a cooperation between a collaboration between Kulbe, the dance group and Institute for Future Studies and us cultivator. And we have invited a lot more, like also Signe, where the piece she's making here will flow on into the project we will show in the end in August, which I also very much love that we can be, institutions can share, like Accelerate uh, shares, that we don't need to own everything, we can be part of a process. Um, 
and this uh, this first has been three workshops. Of course, Corona made everything a bit more difficult, but the Institute uh, made a workshop, Kulbe and us ourselves. This was at the autumn, so we were lucky to have it actually live. Uh, and this is then to see how can science and art work together to make the transition happen, uh, in, if you put it shortly. Uh, and this will then result in August. We will, you will hear a lot about it, hopefully, in the future. But, uh, and also in that even Kulbe is, of course, very uh, experimental and where art in its, the freedom of art is very big. But even they had said, we can get functional now because it's needed. So it's kind of us believing in science and trying to see how we can help out with that. Uh, but maybe in the end discussion, we will come back to it more because now it's time to go to our friends, the worms. So yeah. It. Thank you. So now we are here at the Accelerator, looking at Humus Faculteten or the Soil Faculty that is standing here just a few meters from where we are sitting and the worms are working in there. They are kindly invited as guest researchers in this project and we are humbly trying to assist them in presenting their research. Um, like other researchers, uh, the work of the worms are building on the work of their predecessors. And the work, this work has been going on as long as the exhibition. Is that three months or two months? Yeah. And to translate this into our means of communication, we have extracted a layer of this work and uh, presented it onto an academic paper. I have the paper here. We will look a little bit more at it uh, soon. Uh, as I said before, in the soil faculty, uh, the work is based on previous research. And in this case, uh, this is the ongoing formation of soil that started on this rock, then rock planet that we are on now. That's more than 9 billion years ago which is quite a work. The accumulated information experience that is at the same time the result of and the condition for life. Uh, I have a quote on the definition of soil here that comes from Hans Jenny. It's from 19, in 1941, he said, soil is the result of climate, organisms, topography, parent material and time. Without life, there is no soil. Therefore, according to this definition, Martian soil is not soil unless we discover some forms of life there or long dead life. Um, so life is a part of soil and soil is a part of life. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to read this majestic work, uh, we know that we could not do it even if we spent our lifetime reading this paper. But we will suggest uh, here that we are using uh, the, to, to do. We are suggesting here that we make a shared reading, and we suggest that we are using uh, one minute uh, of awareness, our directed awareness. And in this one minute, I will ask us to try to reach on into our own familiarities with this work. How the to be aware of that we in our bodies and all the bodies before us are a part of this work and how the bodies coming after us will be a part of this work in whatever direction it goes. I will 
show the paper on a slide. And we will start the one minute of awareness here. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing our awareness to that. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about, um, and thank you so much for showing us the earlier works that have progressed, you know, to this place of working, finding ways to collaborate with other species, I think is seems to me to be such a fundamental part of your work at Cultivata and finding kind of ethical models for that to happen. And I think it's really exciting, this turn towards kind of function and activism um, or like a highlighting of that within your practice as well and how to do that collaboratively and ethically with other species. Um, with the worms that we've had here at Accelerator, we have been, you know, really trying to think of them as co-workers the way that you um, suggested from the beginning. So, you know, you put, you, when you proposed this work for experimental field, you really said that the earthworms act as cultural producers and they lay the foundation for all other activities by contributing to the planet's um, thin life um, the, this thin life of um, that we live with and on the topsoil. And so we tried to really, in, you know, here in the office, we've tried to really work with the idea that these worms are our colleagues as cultural workers um, in this system. And so they've been living with and working with the scraps, the um, fruit scraps and the paper scraps from our office, um, from our staff room. And I think, you know, this kind of, um, experience for us as a team at Accelerator to be looking after these worms and to kind of think of them as our co-workers and our colleagues has been really influential to bringing us back to the idea of what is an experimental field. And I think your text just now um, really helped me to hear again, like how our bodies are both part, part future, part past of this topsoil creation as well. Um, so yeah, just thank you very much for that. For that, the, would you like to say any more words about how you imagine that the worms will continue to work within the soil faculty or leaving the soil faculty? Where are they kind of headed to next? Would you like to say anything about that? Yeah, because I think they are heading out into the the experimental field, like into that soil. So we will. Uh, they will go out for the summer they will be working outdoors which i think they will appreciate much more and adding to this uh, ongoing work outside and coming to the experimental fields and go on where others have um, stopped there so i think that's very nice we will i think we will let them out now or before the summer <laughs> And then they are coming back into the exhibition for a last period after the summer break, they will do one more round mm. and then returning to uh, the gardens. I think they will maybe have some work also to do in the garden that we will look more at in the symposium later. Mm. It's a very free faculty. So please everybody that feels free to start a dependence or a little extra office yeah, of yeah. You don't need to ask us. So. Please make more. Yes, exactly. And did you want to say, we, I think we have maybe two more two more minutes, but I just was wondering if you wanted to say any more words about how these kind of methods 
uh, and approaches of ways of collaborating? Like how, what drives you in, in making these, these kind of new collaborations or new forms? Well, it's both. And I think we have different answers, slightly different answers, me and Matthias. Uh, but one thing is the, the shift of perception, like to, to shift perspective somehow to realize how we are part of this, this huge, I mean, the, these issues are huge. It's like the biggest, biggest thing, the beginning of time, the beginning of life. That's what this soil faculty is working on. Uh, and, and yet it's very small, it's very everyday. And, like, and I think to s suggest things, ways to think that can make us realize these things. It's, it's to tell stories in a way that, that could uh, lead us into new ways of thinking and new ways to acting within the ecosystem. That's what's driving. But then we kind of agree. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think also, and there also the importance is that we really need to do this. Yeah. So, to, and then we found out slowly getting lost while doing it, because of course it's a bit tricky, but then you suddenly are at a new place and that yeah. is kind of addictive. Yeah. Uh, because that's of course what drives us artists a lot to find new places. Mm. And yeah, just follow a horse where it wants to show you and you will be the new place. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I feel like we've really followed a few horses today and the footsteps of the worms as well. Thank you so much for this and for the presentation of the paper of the worms as well. I love I love that the faculty decided to present a paper. Um, it's very academic. It's a very academic. Yeah. Exactly. But you will be joining us later this afternoon in the group conversation at 4.30. So I will say goodbye now. Um, and we will be back in just a moment. We're going to have a kind of one or two minute break. We'll be back in just a moment with Pro Associate Professor Stefano Manzoni from the Department of Physical Geography. So we'll be back soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Kotwata. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is lovely to be here uh, in the afternoon of the Soil Symposium. So our next guest is Stefano Manzoni, an associate professor at the Department of Physical Geography here at Stockholm University, where he develops models in the broad area of eco-hydrology to capture the hydroclimactic impacts on vegetation and soil processes from plant to global scales. Um, so welcome, Stefano. And Thank you. you'll be presenting a talk entitled Soil Matters, Life in Soil Shapes, Life on Earth. Um, and just to say as well, you have been one of the researchers who Cultivata have spoken to with the worms as well. So this is um, a return visit for you, but it's lovely to have you here in a public format as well. Um, so I'll give the word over to you, but we will speak a little bit at the end as well. So welcome. Excellent, and thank you very much for the very kind invitation. In fact, I had a conversation with earthworms since I was a kid. I grew up in the countryside, and for me, it has always been a very close relationship. Animals, plants, they are all close to you. You play with them. You, 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 you work with them. You collaborate with them in a way, in a, in a kind of a farm or open, open set. Um, but, but today I would like to give maybe a little bit more of a scientific perspective of why soils matter. And so that's really what my presentation is going to be about. So I'm now going to share my screen and uh, I'll start um, the presentation. Just a second. All right, can you see my screen? Excellent. Very good. So um, again, short presentation on why soil matters. This is a big part of my research, in fact, and I should also acknowledge very briefly my funding sources. Without their support, we could not do the research that we do on soils, their role for our planet, and how we can improve the use of soils for sustainability and, uh, and for our future. 
Uh, when I don't study soils or hydrology or eco-hydrology, I like to walk around and, and cycle. And oftentimes at this time of the year, we can enjoy such a beautiful landscape as this one. Flowers, trees, um, leaves coming out. And uh, the first thing I think is, wow, that's really beautiful. But then as a scientist, I also think, how is that even possible? Ecosystems are so complex and beautiful and, and, and they work and they are resilient to changes. How is it possible? And the same goes for agricultural fields. How can fields produce all the food we need for more than 7 billion people on earth? How does that really work? And part of the answer is actually below, behind, sorry, below our feet. It's hidden, hidden from view. It's down in the soil. And the point I would like to make here is that there is a whole universe which we almost never see. The soil is in our mind often like some dirt, some obscure substance that we don't know much about. So how can we actually appreciate the beauty of soils? Well, we have to dig. And that's what soil scientists generally do. They dig a pit and start exploring the soil. And that's what you can see here in this uh, slide. That these are four soil profiles from different parts of the United States. And immediately you can see that they are very colorful, first of all. They range in color from bright red to dark brown to all the shades of gray and pinkish and reddish. So they are really colorful. But you can also see, just by looking at these pictures, you can almost feel their texture. Soils contain a three-dimensional texture. And that's made of particles, mineral particles. Think about sand and silt and very fine clay. And these particles are kind of aggregated together, glued together through the activity of various organisms, through the activity of roots and, and fungal hyphae. And, uh, and all these biological and chemical processes create additional structure. So you don't only have the texture from the soil particles, but also this kind of clumps, these aggregates of matter in the soil that create additional structure. And you can also see that there is a lot of life underground. You can see roots uh, crossing into the soil profiles. And you can see cracks, you can see many, many different things. But we need to get a little bit closer to really appreciate the complexity of these soils. And if we zoom in to a scale of about one centimeter, we can start seeing some additional features. You can still see roots here. Um, you can kind of recognize some woody material. And if you look close, you can also see that the colors depend on where you are compared to the roots. So there is something going on that has to do with the presence of plants. But you can also see, or, or at least imagine, there are some very, very fine, almost hairs or filaments. These are fungal hyphae. These are kind of roots, but they are made of fungi. They are made of fungal cells that grow to reach out for food or for water. So you can start to see at this scale that there is a lot of life in the soil that is actually really hard to see or to think about when you just look at the landscape above ground. And uh, also on the left-hand side, you can see how in interestingly how this soil, this particular soil is striped. You can see horizontal red, and, uh, and grayish stripes. And that has to do with the chemistry of uh, iron and uh, oxygen uh, deep in the soil. So lots of life, lots of chemistry, some physics all mixed up together. There's, they make up this very amazing material that is the soil. Now, um, in the pictures I showed, there were some cracks, some openings in the soil. These are pores, porosity, we call it in, in technical terms. But there are also other types of openings or, or channels in the soil. And those are made 
by, by animals like earthworms. And in this particular picture, you can see an X-ray image of uh, uh, earthworm, earthworm uh, tunnels in a small, a small soil sample about 30 centimeter long. And as you can see, the earthworms, they just wander around in the soil and they create this network of tunnels, which are pretty much highways from the point of view of soil organisms. So these tunnels, water moves, oxygen and air move more freely. And of course, animals and maybe roots will actually use these tunnels. Um, so a lot of activity is going on around these channels, these, these openings in the soil. And if you lived in the soil, that would be the place where you want to be. That's where you would build your house because that's where water, nutrients, and oxygen um, get together and create optimal conditions for life. So earthworms together with the roots and together with the soil structure create an environment in the soil that is amenable for life. But what type of life, what are we talking about here? Um, again, the soil is, is kind of opaque. It's hard to imagine life in the soil, but even a very tiny volume of soil is really full of life. In one gram of soil, we can count a billion bacterial cells. That means in a spoonful of soil, there are as many bacteria as people on earth. That's a big number. And in one gram of soil, 200 meters of a fungal hyphae, this kind of root network made by the fungi, 200 meters in a volume that is you know, like this, very tiny. And thousands and thousands of species of little animals, bacteria, fungi, archaea, and other microorganisms. So it's a whole universe, and it's all there in a teaspoon of soil. So how can there be so much life in such a little space? Well, these organisms are tiny. And as you can see here, there are, of course, a range of organisms spanning scales from something you can see by eye. Think about a mouse, then an earthworm, and then smaller insects, and then tinier and tinier organisms, all the way down to bacteria, archaea, and viruses. And think about the size of a bacterium cell. It can be as small as one over 10,000 millimeters. Think about it. One millimeter is tiny. Divide that by 10,000. That's the size of a bacterial cell. So you can imagine that as these organisms get smaller and smaller, then they can be really, really numerous. So that you can have, that's why you can have so many billions of bacterial cells or microorganisms in a tiny volume of soil. But what do they actually do in the soil? What do microbes do in the soil? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, they eat, they grow in size, they reproduce, they split, they sleep even, and in the end they die. And they can even get infected by viruses. Maybe not corona, but other viruses that are in the soil and that are actually a big, big players in the creation of biodiversity in the soil. But microbes also breathe. I mean, they don't have lungs, of course, but they do consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, like we do. Because precisely like us, they need to convert food into energy and biomass. And a byproduct of the energy production is carbon dioxide. So does that sound familiar? These are very much the, the things that we do, the way we live. And on top of that, microbes have even a similar chemical composition as human beings. So there is a very close relationship between soil organisms and us. So let's look 
at the three macronutrients, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, C, N, and P. And these graphs here schematically show the relative proportions of these three elements in our bodies on the left, in fungal biomass in the center, and on bacterial biomass on the right. And as you can see, the relative proportions are relatively similar, not exactly the same, but quite close. Okay, so chemically, we are not that different. But of course, we eat different things. Soil microorganisms feed on plant residues or partly decomposed material. And so when, uh, when they see a leaf, a dead leaf, they see food while perhaps we just see a pretty picture. But this creates some challenges. As we all know, diet is key for a healthy life. And we have more or less an idea of what we should eat to have a healthy, healthy life with some carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables, proteins, fats. And we can actually choose what to eat. Microbes in the soil often don't have really a choice. They cannot go to a supermarket and buy their food. So they need to get the food when it's available and whatever they get, they eat. But it's not always perfect for their diet. And you can think about the diet of microbes uh, by looking again at the proportions of macronutrients carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. If your body is made of um, some carbon, some nitrogen, and some phosphorus, you would like to eat food that has a similar chemical composition. But for microbes, that's not always the case. Leaves, dead leaves, for instance, are extremely rich in carbon, but they don't have much nitrogen or phosphorus. So microbes, feeding on dead leaves are basically eating just bread or pasta, but without any sauce, without any cheese throughout their life. So you can imagine it's quite challenging unless you really love pasta. But of course, other microorganisms, they might access kind of better food. If you look into the soil instead of on the soil surface where the leaves are, you can find organic matter that is relatively rich in nutrients. So some microbes actually feed on relatively balanced food with the right proportions of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients. But there is another challenge. In the soil, getting food is hard. Most of the microorganisms cannot really move that much I mean, they are kind of stuck in a solid medium, right? So they have a hard time moving around. Fungi, yeah, they can grow high feet and reach a little bit for their food to some degree, but bacteria can't. So they basically sit and wait. And if they are lucky, they live close to a pore where water is percolating and perhaps water is carrying some nutrients, they can assimilate. So that's not an easy life, but they could also get lucky if an earthworm passes by. Earthworms digest food. They take it in and release it after mixing it thoroughly. So earthworms actually help microorganisms in the soil to get to their food. So to summarize so far, soil is a hidden universe full of life. But life down there is actually quite hard. You can have maybe abundant food, but not nutritionally balanced. Or you could have nutritionally balanced food, but very difficult to get. So not exactly the type of life you would like, perhaps. But despite these challenges, soil organisms carry out their daily routines. They eat, grow, reproduce, 
go to sleep, eventually die. And by doing so, they actually feed our planet and stabilize our climate. So let's now look how that happens. And to do that, let me start from a drawing made by Pietro, one of the kids at the kindergarten of Carisio in Italy. That's the place where I grew up. And Pietro was very observant and he noticed that if you leave an apple in your kitchen for long enough, it will transform. So the red apple you have to begin with will become smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, it will be covered by something green and eventually it will turn black. So what's going on here? Well, we know as grown up, we know that the apple is decomposing. And that's what microorganisms do with leaves, with, or with organic matter in the soil. And, and that process of decomposition starts with the colonization of the apple by fungi, molds, and bacteria. So they will cover it and change the color and eventually transform the apple chemically and eventually the apple will disappear. So partly it disappears because it gets drier, of course, it loses water, but partly because of chemical processes mediated, driven by microorganisms. You can think of these microbes growing on the apple, dying, eating their own bodies while eating also the remaining apple and so forth in a continuous cycle where carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients are continuously moved around. And in this process, as I mentioned before, Microbes also produce the energy they need to live. And by doing so, they release carbon dioxide, CO2, which we know is a greenhouse gas. Okay, so here you can already see the connection with climate. But while doing that, they also transform the nutrients in the apple into another form of nutrients that is actually usable by plants. So this transformation provides the nutrients that allow plants to grow and our ecosystems to thrive. So let's look at the carbon side of the picture a little bit longer. On the left, you can see a schematic from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's kind of this big summary document where scientists explain what's going on with the climate and our contribution to creating a warmer environment. So in this picture, there are many arrows and, and, and numbers. What I want to underline is that in this cycling of carbon globally, soils are really important. They contain more carbon than all the plants on land and the whole atmosphere, okay? So if a lot of carbon from the soil goes to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, we are in big trouble, basically. The greenhouse effect will become much stronger. And microbes contribute about 30% of the natural CO2 emissions from terrestrial ecosystems. So that means that soil microorganisms are really important in this cycling of carbon. Now, in natural conditions, the amount of carbon that the microbes produce actually returns to the soil thanks to plants and photosynthesis, creating a very nice balance of carbon going to the atmosphere, being taken up again by the plants and moving back to the soil and, 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 and so forth. Now, of course, with the human activity, we are disrupting this cycle and adding more CO2 to the atmosphere compared to the natural conditions. But microbes are key in this, in this cycle and without them, we wouldn't live in, uh, in, in, on Earth as we know it. It would be a very different planet. Without greenhouse gases, we would be on a frozen planet, most likely not very good for life. Now, 
I mentioned a little, I talked a little bit about nutrients. So what's going on with this nitrogen and phosphorus? Microbes eat dead leaves where nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are chemically stuck. They are not really available. They are in there, but nobody can use it. But with the help of microbes, these nutrients are released. They become chemically available for plants. And that's how a dead leaf one year will become a fresh new leaf in the following spring, thanks to microbial activity. And then as the plants die in the following autumn, these nutrients will be returned back to the soil, closing the cycle. So again, as for carbon, microbes are fundamental in the cycles of nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients. And as I mentioned before, uh, with our activities and burning fossil fuels, we are breaking the balance. We have already broken the balance between land and the atmosphere, causing climate change. But we have also broken the nutrient cycling balance in our agricultural fields, where we are add chemical fertilizers, which are really easy to get by plants, so that we are kind of decoupling the production from the natural cycling of nutrients in the soil. But these fertilizers in, uh, I mean, large fractions of these fertilizers don't end up in, in the plants. They end up in the water and they cause water quality declines and eutrophication. So breaking the balances of carbon and the nutrients can be problematic. So how do we fix that? How can we restore the balance? Well, we need to keep the microbes and also the other soil animals happy. In this way, they will maintain carbon in the soil and also the nutrients, releasing them slowly so that they don't get lost in the water. And in, in doing so, microbes can actually help stabilizing climate, improving water and nutrient use in our agricultural fields. So how can that be done in practice? How can we keep our microbes happy? Well, there are many approaches, um, soil restoration, organic farming, low intensity practices, agricultural di diversification. These are all practical approaches that can be implemented to keep microbes happy so that they can help maintain carbon in the soil instead of releasing it to the atmosphere and also maintaining functional nutrient cycling in our fields. And I actually encourage you to have a look at the video in, uh, in this website. Um, that's a video on the four per meal initiative that aims precisely at keeping soil microbes happy with some practical, of course, suggestions. So in closing, we started with the question, why do soils matter? And they matter because they are alive in life in soil in the form of microbes, earthworms, and other animals is essential for climate regulation and plant nutrition. So these organisms in the soil can also help us stabilize a warming climate and making our agriculture more sustainable and productive. So how do we do that? How can we help these organisms to perform these essential functions? Well, we need to keep them happy. And that's how I would like to conclude with this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, and I think keeping them happy is just, you know, kind of a plan for the whole afternoon here of the Soil Symposium. Um, but thank you so much for going so deep and but like it's going so deep, but also, you know, being so clear with such clarification of how we can better understand these neighbours um, and how the important work that they do. Um, and thank you for bringing in this art and research perspective in, is it Pietro's artwork that's so beautiful <laughs> from the preschool as well? 
So we yeah, that was actually part of an initiative we had, uh, a collaboration we had with the kindergarten there, yeah. trying to make kids understand why microbes can actually help us. And not all microbes are bad. Now, we live in a world where we are um, scared, and rightly so, because of viruses, infections, and so forth. But the large majority of microorganisms are actually beneficial. We would not be able to live without bacteria in our guts. Mm, exactly, exactly. Oh, thank you so much. Um, but we will leave it there. But thank you very much for, um, for today. And I will see you soon, I hope. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. We'll just go for a little short break um, and we will be back with the people from Stockholm Resilience Centre uh, just in a moment. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Soil Symposium. It is my great pleasure to introduce researchers from the Stockholm Resilience Centre, and they're going to be sharing some aspects of their work with soil, um, kind of zooming out a little bit where we left off with Stefano, going deep into the uh, micro level, going to look a bit more at the macro level this afternoon, looking at food production and sustainability. So firstly, we will hear from Marlon Janelle, who is a researcher at the Bayer Institute, KVA and the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And she is the co-leader of the Food for Resilience research theme at Stockholm Resilience Centre. And her main research interest is sustainable food production. After this brief introduction from Marlon, we will have a longer presentation from, from Jamila Haider, uh, who is also a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre and leader of the Resilience and Sustainable Development research theme. She studies the relationships between cultural and biological diversity through the lens of food. Uh, and she's going to present on her research of Aralashak, the flower of a thousand grains. So welcome, uh, Marlon, I hand the word over to you. Thank you so much and a pleasure to be here. Um, I will try to share my screen. So this should be, it. it's always like when you have a million windows open, it's always a bit stressful. But let's see if we can share as well. This is is really slow but I hope you can hear me so I can start presenting myself so this was at the end of our presentation so that was not so great so my name is Marlene Yonel and I'm um, I'm a re researcher at the Bay Ridge Resilience Center and um, here we go so yeah so I have a background in systems ecology and I've been interested in in food and sustainability for many many years and Primarily, I've been working more, not so much in the brown soil, but more in the in the blue space. So in oceans, aquaculture, fisheries and sustainability. Uh, so but since a couple of years back, I've been broadening my work. And, and now focus on system quality. Intense. And I'm here to present resilience research theme and, and introduce use Jamila as well and um, their food for resilience is one out of six research themes and I'm co-leading this theme together with Amanda Wood who couldn't join today um, and um, Marlon just this, so you know. sorry I just messaged that my connection is unstable so just let me know if you have problem hearing me yeah maybe just go anyway I just try to continue yeah Otherwise, I can. Um, yeah. um, Marlon, you hear me? Video if you Perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, I, I heard you briefly. Can you hear me, or is it like not great? Uh, it's not great. It comes and goes. Maybe, maybe Jamila could present, and then we yeah, could that's join you afterwards. Yeah, should we do that? Sorry yes, about do that. Let's do that. Yeah, I'm sharing now, and I hope Jamila yeah. can take over. And I can say if you were perfect, but it's in the Thank end. Instead, we'll try again afterwards. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks, Malin. And I think, I guess Malin was going to give the big picture of um, the diversity of research at the uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre on food. Um, and I'll be presenting one uh, around around one case of that. So maybe it'll be nice for to get Malin at the end to put the whole thing into um, that perspective. So I'll also go into sharing my screen. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here. And I'm really excited to share um, share some of some of the research that I've done for the past 10 years in the uh, Pamir Mountains. Um, and I got really excited about this topic of soil um, because I'm just absolutely fascinated about how soil can actually be created from, <laughs> from nothing really. So that's kind of the essence of the presentation that I'm going to talk about today about how soil can be created over millennia through the co-evolution um, of people in landscape. And to do that, I'll focus on Arala Shak, which means um, flower of a thousand grains in Shugni, which is uh, one of the Pamiri local languages of which there are many for every valley. Um, and so I'll just start with a, um, a broad overview. Um, this is what the landscape looks like. This is looking from Tajikistan to Afghanistan. And you might ask who can live here and how can we make life here? <laughs> and over millennia, um, people have been moving rocks uh, in order to create this life-giving soil through complex irrigation systems. And this is a picture that I'll come back to. These are five different pulses and grains um, that are sown on the same field and threshed together and then even milled together. Um, and there are ecological and also nutritional benefits for this. And here are two um, Afghani women in Northern Afghanistan making, making naan, a type of flatbread. Um, with a number of those grains. Um, as many of you uh, may know, this is also a region of very intense agricultural or of development, uh, human development interventions. And many of those are um, agricultural development. So this is a picture of all the different agencies working in this, on this field. Um, and there's an agricultural development center just a few kilometers from here. Um, and they're bringing in improved seed varieties, uh, lots of agrochemicals and fertilizers because hunger is a huge problem. Um, there's the, some of the worst human development indicators here, um, including um, um, uh, malnutrition, particularly for women. Um, so this brings up this whole host of, of, of complex problems um, uh, where it's, it's um, what I like to call a biocultural hotspot. And maybe I'll just go to this next picture to try to demonstrate that. Um, where over, again, over, over at least 2000 years, agriculture has um, taken place at 4,000 meters altitude and required incredible human ingenuity in order to create soil in these landscapes, which gives rise to an incredible diversity of, um, of particularly grains, but also fruit and nut varieties. Um, for example, there's 151 varieties of wheat that have been identified. This is also the origin of rye, which um, at least in Sweden is, or in, in much of the world, of course, is an important staple. Um, and and I, so a lot of my work focuses on how can um, we intervene in these types of places in order to improve human well-being, but while celebrating and nurturing and taking care of the incredible diversity that exists here. And um, again, the essence of that ingenuity, I think, starts with um, making soil. So that's a bit what I'll focus on. And um, maybe I think you can still see me a bit while the presentation. So this is a book, just so you can see. <laughs> It's very big, it's 3.1 kilos. Um, and after working for a number of years in development, uh, I became quite disillusioned in, in, in this um, place. And uh, along with Frederick van Odenhoven, um, I wrote this, this book called With Our Own Hands, A Celebration of Food and Life in the Pamir Mountains of Afghanistan and Tajikistan. And this was because um, a grandmother um, served us this amazing, delicious soup, which was made with um, ara, um, aralashak, a, a mixture. It's all not always the same. It's always different grains and different legumes, but it's a type of soup with a very thin um, and delicious um, noodle. Um, and we became fascinated by this. And she said, well, if you're interested, why don't you write down my recipe? Because no one, these languages um, are unwritten and no one really cares about them anymore. So that was how this started. And it was a five-year journey um, for us to, to document some of these recipes. And I'll just again uh, focus on, on 
on kind of the, the origin and the creation of soil uh, for today. And um, yeah, so here's just a picture of the place. This was drawn uh, as a, it's an artistic depiction of, of, the, of the map. So we're looking at primarily Tajikistan and also this part, this was called the Wakhan Corridor in Afghanistan. And here's Pakistan and the Hindu Kush Himalaya mountain. And this is called the Pamir range. Um, and so the book starts by talking about uh, grains and pulses and the origin of life. And one of the first photographs in this book is this photograph. And here, I hope you can see my cursor, but this, this mound in the back, um, it's, it's a place also of worship um, where um, people come to um, pay their respects. There's a very interesting mix of Zoroastrianism, um, so fire worship, but also integrated um, with um, Ismaili Islam um, traditions. And they say that this is the god Nu, uh, like Noah, for those who are familiar with the story of Noah, but for um, Islam it's in, in, in Nu. Um, and they say that this mound of, of, of soil <laughs> was created by, by his hands. And um, one of every um, plant and animal um, was, was put into this original um, soil, which was put here in, with these hands. Um, so this is the origin of life um, in the in Pamiri oral history. And I'm sorry, the quality of this is a bit poor. It's a screenshot of, of the book, but this is um, also the, um, the um, the origin of um, Ara Lashak, and it's called Lashak Mach, which is a different type, um, or it's this mixture of grains and and legumes. And of course, as um, like any or many agronomists who visited this region, the region have kind of said, "Oh, what a mess! There's no you know rhyme or reason to this." But of course, um, for 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 many people studying soil now, we know what a what um, uh, how important it is to to intercrop and to be um, replenishing the soil with nitrogen um, and the importance of legumes. But what's really, I think, beautiful also in this, in this system is, um, and I don't even have time to go into the depth of detail here, but it's it starts from the very beginning. So with the tradition around Navruz, which is the Persian New Year, when a handful of seeds are thrown into the hearth and it's the seeds that, that are left that are then chosen to um, sow on the field that year. Um, and, and again, it's a mix of, of different wheat, uh, and rye and grass pea, um, uh, and lentils. And it's, um, again, it's not done in rows. It's all kind of mixed up together and it's then, uh, harvested in one, threshed in one and milled, um, together as well. And so these are just some of them. This was just um, a non-strategic sampling. This was just a beautiful handful that we picked on one field. Um, and this is then on, one, on a rooftop. And what we did in the book was um, um, try to identify these in the Dari, Tajik language, Shukni, uh, Rushani, and Wahi. And while this seems like it should be a simple exercise, it took many months uh, and um, uh, hot discussions um, around different names for these. Um, legumes and grains in in the different valleys and we've probably made mistakes as well and indeed we have people have told us they have different opinions um, on this and so rather than this being a monument it should really be um, like a living a living and breathing um, uh, process um, that we that we hope lives on <laughs> um, and yeah, this is just a picture of the threshing. This is um, in a boy in northern Afghanistan and one of the traditional water mills um, in which many of these grains are um, milled often together. Not always, but often together. Um, and I just have two more photographs here. Um, uh, this is a teacher. His name is Sakori. And he's um, also been quite sad about the declining traditions um, in, in the Pamirs around um, grain cultivation in particular. And so he's created different dances. Right here, he's performing the harvest dance, um, which he teaches school children um, on the different steps and processes of wheat harvest. Um, uh, and 
this is a picture of a man with what he calls his second bread. He was very embarrassed when we arrived. Um, it's very traditional to offer uh, tea and bread to guests. And the reason I wanted to show this photograph is um, it's, it's white bread and refined flour that is imported, which is the prized bread. And I think this is so common, of course, across the world. Um, but it really, it demonstrates um, how I think a celebration of these, these diverse and often forgotten um, varieties can can help bring them to the to the fore again um, and yeah again there's there's kind of a, a, a long story around this but this is a red wheat that's used during the Persian New Year and is brought um, to to um, um, spiritual places to help uh, to ask for for good harvest um, and so this was yeah I'll just end it there um, and I guess what I was um, yeah, just wanted to, to end with there is the book for us was a very surprising journey. Um, it's a like pseudo biocultural hist history narrative. We included a lot of local um, uh, scientists and also artists and uh, women and grandmothers and their stories in there. Um, and parts of it are a bit more scientific, but so it's a real mix, um, but it's ultimately a recipe book. And we were very surprised in, in 2016, it won um, the Gourmand Award for the best cookbook in the world. And the reason I bring that up is we brought one book back for every village in the Tajik and Afghan Pamir Mountains, so about 2000 copies. So now every village has at least one copy. Um, and it's the first time a lot of this knowledge has been documented. And looking through it, um, one of the first reactions was, you've captured this knowledge that used to only exist in our hands. Um, so it's been an, an ongoing um, journey and um, hopefully we hope that the celebration of this knowledge in, in this way can also help it um, live on and help nurture these soils for also millennia to come. So thanks again. And I look forward to um, yeah, hearing, hearing from you if you're interested, thanks. Thank you so much, Jamila. So fascinating. And as you say, like this, you know, finding ways to bring this knowledge to other audiences is such a big part of what the possibility of what art can do in these circumstances. And a cookbook, I think, is like the one of the coolest kind of contemporary art moves is making like mm. a beautiful <laughs> um, recipe book that can actually like mean that people can gather around this and enjoy these traditions and new versions of these traditions themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks. Yeah, and I guess I'll just I'll say to that, um, uh, given the diversity of audience, um, perhaps here is that um, it's it was a very difficult book to design because it's English, uh, um, Farsi, which is written uh, left to right, and then uh, Tajik, um, which is in Cyrillic script. So it was a very difficult and uh, challenging design um, book, and we've we've worked with also three wonderful photographers. Um, so it was it definitely became. Um, an evolving art uh, work even if it didn't start in that way mm, exactly but I think it just it's just such a beautiful project and such a beautiful way to share you know research that can um, that could have just lived in an academic paper that isn't necessarily shared out beyond the walls of the institution so I think it's wonderful that you found this mm -hmm. this way um, Marlon I don't know if you're here or not Marlon Marlon maybe maybe not I am actually here, but my, my computer actually crashed. It happened one bef once before with Zoom that it's suddenly it, nothing is working and uh, it becomes black. So everything had to start over. But I'm here again. And I don't know if I should dare to uh, try to share those slides again, but maybe I keep my video off. So fingers crossed. Let's let's try and see if it's... Let hot go and then we'll see. Yeah, it's exactly. Not exactly. But you can... Yeah, perfect. Let's see. And I'll try to be brief. Oh. So in, I should ideally have, have started this as, as more of an over and overview of the, the food work at the Stockholm Resilience Center. But I tried to start over and see if it works. I can, it doesn't look so strange as last time. So I just see if I can continue. So again, then my name is Malin Yonel and I'm one of the co-leads of the Food for Resilience team at the Stockholm Resilience Center. I have a background in systems ecology, but have worked very like interdisciplinary with um, methods and, and frameworks from social science for 
um, many, many years. And I've been interested in food also for, for 10 years or so, primarily at the blue realm. So quite far from the brown soil, but more uh, in the oceans and aquatic environments. But since uh, five years or so, more, more food broadly. So the Food for Resilience theme is one out of six research themes at the Stockholm Resilience Center and gathers uh, a lot of different work and, and focus areas and interests among our members. So we have 20 plus members or so and we're growing quite rapidly. Um, and uh, researchers in this theme focus on everything from local food production systems, gastronomic landscapes, the role of chefs in, in like... Um, uh, accelerating transformation of the system to um, more supply chain, trade, life cycle assessment, the role of large global transnational co corporations in driving change. So a big variety, but a lot of common interests as well. And we do have a common vision of a world with resilience, uh, resilient, equitable food systems that work in service of sustainability. And Amanda Wood is my co-lead and she was supposed to be here today, but uh, couldn't make it, unfortunately. And we 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 focus our work in in three different uh, action tracks, as we call them. So one of them is focusing on transdisciplinary research, acknowledging the need to work with non-academic actors when producing knowledge that is of relevance for society. The second one is on navigating the solution space, and I will come to that in a minute. And the third one is on food system resilience and equity in the Anthropocene. And this one is also bringing in the equity concept. And, and here we would like to emphasize and research um, how, to, how to transform the food system in, in an equitable manner. And just to give some background, so this is really, really zooming out, but food production today is, is one of the major drivers of global environmental change and accounts for around 20 to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions, um, and the majority of land use by diversity loss and leakage of nutrients and also water consumption. So it's really one of these human activities that impact the planet the most. So in order to reach global targets such as the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, we really need to get it right with food. And food is also impacting our bodies substantially, like two, 2 billion people lack key micronutrients and another 2 billion people are overweight or obese and including half of the Swedish population. So we are in the midst of it here as well. Um, so we, we have a, a, both an environmental crisis and a health crisis and, and also, of course, equity and social dimensions linked to this. Uh, so one of the research themes uh, or tracks under the theme is navigating the solution space. And, and this is just to give you a flavor of what we're doing in the theme at the moment. And here we are trying to better understand how different solutions in food, it could be everything from eat local, agroecology, organic farming to big, big greenhouse gases in the middle of cities or, or lab grown beef or um, anything that is more uh, collaborative, so working with, with big companies maybe, or, uh, or similar things. So how can we better understand how well these different solutions work and how can we better understand how they impact each other and what the transformable transformability capacity these different solutions have. And yeah, that, that was it for me. And uh, it was really nice to, to listen to part of your work, Jamila, and uh, to get uh, to get that that really local perspective and with those beautiful photos. So thanks for that. So I stop sharing here and we'll we'll stay if you have any questions. I even tried to to show myself again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for that. And it's so interesting to hear about what this theme at Stockholm Resilience Center is working in the the scale and the breadth. Um, of your work there. Um, I think you were saying that it's quite a new theme, I think, when we spoke. Yeah, it's one of the new themes. I mean, we in the we, we did the the center did a reorganization by the by the fall. So since then we have a couple of new themes. The development theme that Jamila is leading is also one of the new ones, and others are, are with new new leadership structures. So we are all of the themes are excited about how to move forward in a good way. But it's a quite unusual way to, to organize research. So essentially moving out from the traditional research groups where you may gather under a project or a leader, but here we, 
we try to gather regularly and to explore new research questions together and and we're coming from many, many different both disciplinary backgrounds but also with different focus areas both in terms of spatial scale and and also what the topics are exactly thank you so much i think thank i'm you. Leave it there but this was just perfect um i'm going to quickly introduce the next part so i'll just say thank you both very thank very you much. so much thank, thank you. you that's brilliant um, we are going into a digital break now, um, and so I wanted to just introduce that a little bit before um, it comes on. So next up, we have a very special commission uh, for the Soil Symposium from Emily Person. And Emily Person is an artist working with the collaboration between film, sculpture, material learning and oral storytelling. Her research and practice organises itself in playful and speculative ways um, as it looks at how we collectively can challenge and retell our ecological and phenomenolo phenomenological realities. The artist has produced a digital break uh, today for us in this long afternoon of soil chat. Um, and this is a moment of rejuvenating mediation for all of us in the digital realm today. And it's intended as a moment to stretch and readjust and to come into soil thinking with an embodied approach. Um, the video work is called Groundings and forms part of a larger body of work that the artist is developing around the hybridity of material relations between computers and soil, and especially how they collaborate in marking imaginary and grammatical horizons. So we will watch uh, grounding now, which is around 10 minutes, the video, um, and then it will go into a, another section. There's a lot more Bronwyn's, past Bronwyn's to come. So the past Bronwyn will um, introduce some reflections on art and research, um, which will be after that. And there's even another past Bronwyn who's speaking to a wonderful researcher, Sabina, who will appear inside that section as well. So we have two um, quite exciting pieces coming up and then we'll meet back here live on Zoom at 3.30 p.m. But you can just keep watching through. It's going to stream the whole way. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in here with us. Um, I look forward to seeing you soon.
Slowly stick out your tongue, tiny bit at a time. Sensing how the taste changes. Temperature changes. Moist changes. Face changes. It starts like I think like everybody has um has a memory of what of what um of what soil tastes like. Even though it was really, really long ago, you had soil last. But I think most of us can kind of reminisce. For me, it's a very like metallic flavor. The buzzword, I mean, or the fact of. Everybody trying to reimagine new futures and come up with new solutions and new names and new, 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 microscopes to look in, or like before we knew that there were all these different parts like working together, did we like know it even then somehow? Did we like grasp it or gravel? Like how did we describe it? Like how, how did we, how was that knowledge transferred or inscribed anyway? How did we come to our senses with it? I was a kid, I used to like um, imagine what it would be like if you had eyes on top of your fingertips and think if you would like stick them into the soil. You know this thing when you pull your fingers on your uh, eyeballs, like massaging your eyeballs really really hard so you start to see like all these cloudy sparkling landscapes like coming at you. Like, and you like open it up again and it'd be full of the world would just be like full of sparkling, snapping synapses and then bloom and and then my mama would be like, No no no, don't do that. <laughs> but now we have instead we don't need eyes on fingertips because we have all of these prolongations, these extra eyes that can look really, really close the microscopes and the telescopes that can look really really far but it kind of all looks the same anyway. The machinery, the in-machinery, in-machinery, imaginary, machinery. So if we're actually going to do this, or if we're actually talking about reimagining or um, Reframing or recontextualizing or, or resensing our ways to be in this collaboration. And is it really like new images that we need, or do we just need to remember? Remember what it's like. Not looking at a grounding as a as a way to retreat, but as a way to return, as like a way to remember. Remember what it's like when your synapses go like, it's time.
Hello. In this section, we're going to reflect on art and research. Um, I'm going to read some notes reflecting on the process of art and research um, as part of the experimental field. So to begin, soil, matter, experiments, time, archives, worms, artists, composting, group dynamics. I want to start with a quote from Donna Haraway um, speaking about situated knowledges. She says, webs of knowledge and power can have the property of being systematic, e even of being centrally structured global systems with deep filaments and tenacious tendrils into time, space and consciousness, which are the dimensions of world history. What is it to think together with artists, researchers, a university and a constal? How will the entangled web of ways of knowing show itself? At Accelerator, we are creating a series of meeting points between agents. In the art and research program, we are attempting to highlight and take part in the web of interconnected ways of knowing that are built together in, around, amongst, and within Stockholm University. When Accelerator's underground gallery opened for the first time in October 2019, artist Tino Segal's work, This Progress, generated encounters between visitors and the participants who were present in the exhibition spaces. Many of the interpreters of the work were researchers from Stockholm University. Thousands of small moments of meeting took place. Setting sparkling conversations, some grand, some private, some curly, some sweet. What swelled from this process was the desire for the meetings to continue. A curiosity to see how encountering each other could lead to new knowledge moments. This curiosity has continued in the exhibition of Johanna Gustafsson Furscht where many language scholars continued to contribute to the public program and also contribute behind the scenes with the artist, Johanna Gustafsson Furscht herself. Art and research at Accelerator has also continued to flow into the experimental field, Accelerator's first group exhibition. With my wonderful colleagues, especially curator Therese Kellner, this season, the art and research program has been working with the themes and ideas connected to the production of the exhibition, The Experimental Field. And it has been about connecting artists and researchers who share interests in questions of sustainability, forestry, ways of living, the history of agriculture, environmental activism, human animal connections, and more. We'll now watch a short clip um, with myself and Associate Professor of Social Psychology at Stockholm University, Sabina Sihajik Clancy, reflecting on her encounter with art and research during the experimental field. How, yeah, this encounter that you had as part of art and research at Accelerator, um, you were approached around your expertise at Stockholm University around group dynamics and group relations for the group O um, and the non-existent centre. So I was just wondering, like, what was your um, experience of this encounter of meeting um, artists and talking to them about your work and their work? I mean, first of all, it was it was very uh, pleasant. I was pleasantly surprised to, to actually have had that encounter because I think it's very rare that um, scholars and researchers um, communicate in such meaningful ways mm. uh, with with artists and with art and I believe also based on my previous um, uh, relations and work and collaboration with um, artists from the Balkan region particularly the filmmakers mm. um, and photographers etc um, I have learned to appreciate these forms of, of collaboration because essentially 
As with this uh, encounter uh, with the artist from the accelerator, um, you really learn a lot. I mean, there's like a mutual learning experience mm. and really mutual um, a sharing of, of, of added perspectives almost. So I, my experience was as much as um, I hope <laughs> that it was useful for them to talk to me um, and, um, and to hear about my experience with working with um, uh, sensitive social groups or mm. individuals who come from sensitive, traumatic, um, uh, conflict kind of in environments, as much as it might have been useful for them to talk to me, it was also very useful for me to, to, to think about how we can not just communicate our work, but use our work. Um, uh, use the research that we do to to basically you know improve societies you know mm. uh, that mm. we are all part of mm. so it was extremely extremely useful and, and not just useful but I was all I was just pleasantly um, in, um, surprised by this openness as well you know mm. Mm. thank you Sabina I, I completely agree it was it was one of these meetings where you know we kind of went into it thinking that we would learn about group dynamics and I think actually what we came out with was this much more kind of realizing that there was a lot of similarities in your research and the way that yeah. the artists approached um, ways of thinking about connections to people um, and as you say like this especially around the idea of trauma yeah. and the sensitivity that you need to bring to be able to ask questions. So um, in the work, It Takes a Village that the, the artists have developed um, for this show, you know, they were building a set um, of, of kind of interrelational, interpersonal kind of um, really deep kind of um, formations to set this kind of group in motion. And so your expertise around how to, discuss that as a researcher and how to approach um, kind of trauma and sensitive issues was really, really, really helpful um, for them. And yeah. I know. Um, I'll have to do that. Yeah. And yeah, definitely. Yeah. And yeah, and as you say, I love it's this mutual exchange. Um, yeah. And I think what was really exciting as well working with you was that you had spoke because you've worked with other collaborations with art um, and filmmakers and things. I think you also brought that kind of sensitivity where you were just like, oh, I see you. I see what you how you're working here. Yeah. Um, and I think like this is something that often happens when people begin to engage with art is that they see the patterns of kind of artistic thinking in other fields mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, um, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it was simple. really usually. Um, I mean, um, often when 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 different disciplines and different um, perspectives start to communicate, it takes often a lot of time to find a common ground, right? Mm. Or kind of common understanding or common language, just to to understand each other. But what my experience was that we very quickly found that common ground. That we didn't need needed <laughs> neither side needed. Um, you know. Um, to waste time on trying mm -hmm. to understand the other, the understanding started to flow, and I was very surprised by by the depth of the of the of the questions and understanding from where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. so, so that was that was good. That was absolutely. Good. When thank I think back about it. extra, thank you to Sabina for reflecting, um, and I hope you could hear that audio okay with her. Um, but thank you to Sabina for reflecting on what it was like to encounter art and research with the group O, and their work. It takes a village. Um, and so I just wanted to also thank um, some other researchers, mainly from Stockholm University, but a few from outside of that as well that have contributed to this program. So just to name them quickly, I'd like to thank Stefan Bergvik, who's a professor in history of science and ideas in the Department of Culture and Aesthetics, and also Karen Dirk, who is the associate professor in history of ideas also at the same Department of Culture and Aesthetics. Jason Sanetsky, um, who's the Olaf Palmer Visiting Professor in the Law Department uh, for 2020, and Christina Fredengreen, Associate Professor in the Department of Archaeology and Classical Studies, Stefano Manzoni, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Physical Geography. Sorry, sorry, Stefano, I think you're actually Associate Professor there. Uh, Jamila Hader, Amanda Wood, and Marlon Jon Jonell, who are all um, researchers at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Christina Schaefer, who is an academic and cultivator at the Department of Physical Geography, 
uh, Emmeline Lassio um, Am Bjornsons, who is a doctoral student at the Department of Human Geography. Sabina, who we've just heard from, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Psychology. Anders Westfeldt, who is a professor at the Department of Cultural Geography. And then from outside Stockholm University, the other contributors, especially for today, are Jana Holmstedt and Marlon Nobel from the Humus Economicus at the National Historical Museums and artist Emily Person. Um, there are also more researchers as, who are contributing to upcoming events for art and research, especially as part of Signe Johannesson's event with Christina Fredengreen and Kulberi. Um, so that is Postum Dialogue, which is happening on the 25th of August. And then just after that, on the 9th of September, we have the beautiful work, A Day Through Forest Calling, A Never-Ending Contaminated Collaboration or Dancing is a Form of Forest Knowledge is a bus trip and visit to the public artwork on which Marlon Arnell and Orsel Zian's participation in experimental field is based. There are many more researchers contributing to those programs too. And of course, um, I've just mentioned Signe Orsa Marlin, um, and they are some of the wonderful artists from the experimental field who have really um, worked closely in the art and research program this year. Um, but also, of course, the non-existent centre um, and the group O, um, who have really worked with a lot of different researchers and people from Stockholm University as well with their creation of their work, but also in the lead up, um, for example, with Sabina, who we just heard from. Um, and then, of course, the um, Art, and Agri Ag Art and Agriculture Collective Cultivata, whose process-based work, process work is in collaborate, collaboration with Cultural Working Worms. So we thank the Worms for their collaboration as well. So, um, yeah, finally, I just wanted to return to the words of Donna Haraway um, that I started with today, and I paraphrase her here when she talks about situated knowledges. But what I hear her say is that webs with deep filaments and tenacious tendrils into time and space and consciousness build knowledge. And it's for me, this kind of web building and web making is what really art and research um, is about. And so these kind of encounters and processes, they're not meant to be translated into a singular set of outcomes. They're meant to be kind of messy sets of processes that are designed to create situations where learning together and thinking across disciplines and having art and artists and exhibitions as the central pillar of process um, towards new knowledge making encounters. This is kind of the web of connections, disconnections and reconnections that I think art and research um, aspires to. And so in this kind of beautifully slow process, I think that art and research emerges and submerges at the same time. Um, and in this process, we all become web climbers and web builders. So there are reflections on art and research um, as part of the experimental field. And we look forward to the next part um, of the symposium. Okay, thank you, everybody. Hello, welcome back to the Soil Symposium. For the next section, we're actually going to take this part in Swedish. So, jag ska säga välkomna tillbaka. Um, och den nästa session här heter Si Jordan med Humus Economicus Samla Repertorium och Skogsträdgården med Kristina Schäfer från Institut för Naturgeografi och de konstnärliga förstånden. Malen, jag tror du behövs bli lite mutad där, förlåt. Muta dig där. Um, och de konstnärliga forskarna, eh, Jana Holmstedt och Malen Lobel. Så jag ska introducera våra tre gäster här. Så varm välkomna här. Christina Schäfer är en akademika och odlar. Hon undervisar på två vetenskapliga utbildningar som rör hållbar som hålls utveckling på Stockholm universitet. Sedan 2012 är hon lärare på en sommarkurs där tillämpad ödling praktik 
praktikeras av studenter på campusområdet. Den framväxande trädgården är en del av det gamla experimentfältet. Malen Lobel, välkomna, är en konstnär och trädgårdsmastare och har i flera år arbetat under teamet Vad och vem ryms i en medborgerlig trädgård? Om växters politis- politiska roll, livmedelsproduktion samt, man- men- <laughs> samt mänskliga och mer än mänskliga relationer. Hon har tillsammans med Janna Holmstedt startat konst- och försäkringskollektiv Part of the Biomass. Och sen nummer tre här är Janna Holmstedt. Välkomna till dig. Um, och Janna är en konstnär och forskare med ett särskilt intresse för lyssnade och situerade praktiker. Genom installationer, soundwalks och processerier processorienterad verk utförsäker hon parasitiska, sociologiska och biokulturella relationer. Hon har integrerat konst- och försäkningsprojekt Humus Economicus vid Statens historiska museet där även Malen Lobel ingår. Så mest välkomna, jag ska handa över till Janna och Malen första. Tack Bronwyn för introduktionen. Fantastiskt. Och tack Humusfakulteten för det här jordsymposiet. Det har varit en jättespännande dag, verkligen. Och bara tanken på att bli inbjuden till en fakultet där maskarna sätter agendan gör jag i alla fall mig upprymd. Vi delar kärleken till masken. Så jag och Malin kommer först att berätta om vårt pågående arbete innan vi lämnar över till Kristina Schaffer som kommer att berätta mer om skogsträdgården som finns precis utanför Accelerator och vad som egentligen menas med skogsträdgårdsordning. Så jag ska försöka dela skärm här på en gång. Jag hoppas att ni ser. Um, ja, idag har vi ju gett många sätt att se på jord. Från mikroliv till livsmedelsförsörjning. Uh, och det är där vi rör oss också. Från det mikroskopiska till det storskaliga. För att se vad vi kan lära oss av jordarna. För att få bättre känsla för jord. Och det universum som jord är. Uh, och Stefano gav ju en jättefin beskrivning tidigare på Why Soils Matter. Um, utan jord, inga samhällen. Och vi jobbar liksom kultivator med relationer mellan stad och land och att odla sociala och ekologiska relationer genom att samarbeta med jord. Som många av er kanske vet så är det latinska ordet homo som betyder människa språkligt besläktat med humus som betyder jord. Och på liknande sätt har ekonomi samma rot som ekologi genom det grekiska ordet oikos som benämner både hushåll, egendom och familj. Och även om ekonomi och ekologi idag nästan kanske framstår som varandras motsatser så betyder ekonomi ursprungligen att hushålla med resurser. Så, vi behöver inte ta de gamla grekerna som modell, de höll sig trots allt med slavar. Men det är talande att se tycker jag vad orden och språket har vuxit fram med. Vilka praktiker och relationer som formar språk. För språk formar också handlingar och kulturer. Donna Haraway föreslår att vi ska säga humusiora istället för humaniora. Humusitis istället för humanities. Och hon är inte den enda som tar komposten till hjälp för att beskriva både kunskapsprocesser och hur vi biologiskt sett faktiskt inte är särskilt mänskliga om vi ser till mikrobiomet. Vi är snarare en hel flock av ömsesidigt beroende mikroorganismer. Precis som den levande jorden består av mil- miljontals okända varelser. Så just maskarna påminner i alla fall mig om hur vi människor är en del av jordarnas metabolism. Överskottet från en organism är föda för en annan. Ett ständigt utbyte av näring pågår hela tiden runt omkring oss. Vi är del av biomassan. Vi ska också bli jord, bli en del av mullkroppen. 
Och jag och Malin jobbar ihop i kollektivet Part of the Biomass som också poängterar the art of the biomass. Och den här bilden eh, visar då både part of the biomass där, men det är också en, från en utställning i Malmö som pågår just nu, Sustainable Societies for the Future, där vårt verk då heter Fyra systrar för plantropocen. Och eh, inomhus så är det nu en installation där frön, majsfrön, ligger och ljudbadar i väntan på att få planteras ut. Utställningen öppnades i januari. Eh, och utomhus, Janna, <håller>, håller också på att förberedas eh, en odlingsplats på museets borgård. Eh, Janna. Eh, verket, det här är en poster som hänger inne på museet också, men som beskriver hela året eller processen här som vi jobbar fram. Den växer fram som en slags skul social skulptur genom att vi kopplar olika händelser till årstiderna, och programpunkter. Och det börjar då inomhus på museet med gåvan eh, och fortsätter sedan ut med, plant eh, med jordfesten som vi kommer tillbaka till här som vi gjorde i mitten av april. Och under plantans skola i slutet på maj här så kommer vi då plantera ut systrarna och även andra stödjande systrar. Den odlingen är inspirerad eller lite byggd då efter skogsträdgårdens principer och kopplad då till Kristinas berättelse här senare. Men vi återkommer att berätta mer om det här verket lite senare. Janna. Ja, och vi samarbetar också i det eh, nystartade konst- och forskningsprojektet Humus Economicus eh, vid Statens Historiska Museer. Ett projekt som är helt dedikerat till jord. Eh, det status och värde, särskilt i urbaniserade landskap. Och projektet är finansierat av Formas och kommer löpa under fyra år. Eh, vi började i januari. Och det är människans relation till jord vi fokuserar på. Med frågan, har vi blivit jordblinda, trots att vårt samhälle är helt beroende av det jordarna både ger och gör, som också Stefano visade tidigare. Som ni säkert vet om människor- och jordrelationerna förändrats rätt radikalt de senaste hundra åren bara, medan jordbrukets historia sträcker sig minst 12 000 år tillbaka i tiden. Det har uppfunnits på många olika platser, oberoende av varandra. På plogen, från att ha varit en revolutionerande uppfinning har allt mer kommit att utmålas som boven i ett 6000 årigt drama kan man säga. Där jordarnas komplexa liv successivt har utarmat och eroderat så människans framfart och expansion. Men plogen är inte den enda berättelsen om jordbrukets historia. Det finns andra sätt att bruka och leva med jord. Stadsodling verkar till exempel ha varit en integrerad del av stadsplaneringen i majakulturer i förkolumbiansk tid. Och täckodling och komposter det kom till Europa från Asien. Och även när de svenska städerna bildades var trädgården och odlingen en självklar del. Och det finns jättespännande forskning där inom ett nytt fält som kallas för trädgårds, eller arkeobotanik och trädgårdsarkeologi. Och särskilt väl märks kanske jordblindheten i en industrialiserad kultur och ekonomi där markvärde går före jordvärde. I Sverige bygger vi just nu på några av Europas mest bördiga jordar, som här utanför Malmö till exempel, trots att jord klassas som en hotad och ändlig resurs globalt och i Sverige anses vara ett nationellt intresse. Just det här området i Hylje som ni ser på bilden har kallats den svarta jorden. Vilket beskriver hur bördig den är. Och skyddet av odlingsbara jordar är rätt svagt eh, i Sverige. Självförsörjningsgraden i Sverige har också sjunkit sedan 1980-talet. Något som nu ifrågasätts då vi ställs inför oberäkneliga klimatförändringar och pandemin som vi just nu genomlever. Så vi behöver ju tänka om vad och hur vi äter. Det tar enormt lång tid innan vittringen och växterna har skapat ny jord som är djup nog för skogen att växa i och människor att leva av. Det är därför jord klassas som en ändlig resurs. 
inte bara urbanisering utan det industriella jordbruket i sig med mycket kemikalier och tunga maskiner utav de här jordarna. Men det finns sätt att arbeta regenerativt och hjälpa till och återskapa jord. Och det är fascinerande att se hur mycket som beror på en frisk och levande jordmån. För det handlar om så mycket mer än enbart mat. Eh, mullrika jordar eh, kan mildra effekterna av klimatförändringarna. Eftersom de kan suga upp stora mängder vatten så blir effekterna av torka och översvämningar inte lika extrema. Och jordarna renar ju också vatten. Och något som inte många vet är att de också binder stora mängder koldioxid från atmosfären och lagrar den i marken. Så jordarna är kolsänker och det är en av anledningarna till att vi inte borde plöja så hårt och djupt. Så jordarna spelar en nyckelroll för hållbara sätt att leva och det gör det tillsammans med växter och svampar och mikrober om vi tillåter det. Om vi samarbetar med dem eller eh, keep them happy som Stefano sa. Just Malin ja. kanske kan berätta om. Mm. Precis, vi startar alltså det här projektet i januari, det är ett fyraårigt projekt. På humusekonomicus.se som det här är en bild ifrån då, hemsidan så kan man följa projektet och vad vi gör. Man kan säga att vi kommer att bjuda in till olika vandringar, workshops, seminarier och utställningar. Vi jobbar tvärdisciplinärt i vårt samlaboratorium, vårt kollaboratori, där vi också bjuder in olika gäster. Det är sex personer som ingår i forskarteamet. Kristina eh, Fredengren, hon är arkeolog och har ni träffat tidigare på Accelerator då hon har jobbat med Signe Johannesen eller samarbetat där. Hon bidrar till det här projektet då med forskning kring djuptid eh, och rättvisa mellan generationer och är särskilt intresserad av kritiska studier om jord som natur, kultur, arv, jordformeringsprocesser och fertilitet. Och sen har vi Cecilia Åsberg som är professor i genus, natur och kultur vid Linköpings universitet. Hon är också grundare på Post Humanity Hubben, en forskargrupp som varit verksam sedan 2008. Och hon är också en initiativtagare då till Seedbox i Linköping, ett forskningsprogram för miljö humaniora. Man kan säga att hon forskar om vad som räknas som naturligt och därmed socialt och ideologiskt laddat och vad som räknas som mänskligt, humaniserat eller avhumaniserat. Karin Vegsjö som också är med i Part of the Biomass, hon är filmare och regissör och hennes intresse och undersökning ligger i hur maktstrukturer fungerar och hur de då fungerar som bidrar till att mikrolivet i jorden dör. Vilken påverkan maktstrukturen har på jordens död kan man säga då. Eh, sen har vi också Jenny Lindblad som är vid samhällsbyggnad och urbana studier på KTH. Hon medverkar i projekt utifrån forskning om jordar och jordprocesser i stadsplanering och stadsutveckling. Med fokus på hur praktiker och tekniker inom planering formar relationer mellan stad, jord och människa. Det är väl några av dem, ja. Så vi kan få in olika glasögon och perspektiv helt enkelt i vårt projekt. Så vi utgår alltså från jord som en levande kultur, eller biokultur, där natur och kultur inte på ett enkelt sätt kan skiljas åt. Och vi går från djuptid till framtid eh, samtidigt som vi ser hur mer än enbart mänskliga perspektiv skulle kunna rymmas i vår syn på jord och, och samhälle. Och hitta sätt att samlas kring jord och ge det lokala perspektivet också. Så jord knyter samman mer än hälften av de globala hållbarhetsmålen som ekonomisk, social och ekologisk hållbarhet flödar samman i frågan om just jord. Och eftersom jordarna också är nära förbundna med vatten, mat, skog, kemikalier och biologisk mångfald. Um, här är en bild på en av det moderna jordbrukets skogplatser skulle man kunna säga. Det är en konstgjord ö utanför Landskrona som är uppbyggd av restprodukter från fosfortillverkning. Fosfor ingår i konstgödsel, det som kallas MPK. Och I början så släpptes de här gipsresterna rakt ut i havet. Tanken var att ön som då började anläggas 1978 skulle hängas in och ta hand om giftiga ämnen på ett mer säkert sätt. 
Och det här reningsarbetet är fortfarande inte avslutat. Fosfor som jordbruket är helt beroende av är också en ändlig resurs som håller på att ta slut. Då vad skulle mer än mänskliga perspektiv kunna tillföra samhällsplaneringen för hur vi ser på kulturarv och naturarv, för vår syn på värde och ansvar över generationsgränserna. Och vi använder inte bara fakta utan även fiktion och tillåter oss att spekulera i vad som skulle kunna ske i en övergång från homo economicus som sätter den uteslutande ekonomiskt beräknade människan i centrum till humus economicus. Går det att tänka sig en jordens ekonomi? Hur skulle ett jordbundet ekonomiskt system kunna se ut? Vad för slags relationer, utbyten och kretslopp skulle vara styrande? Vilka värden skulle stå i centrum? Och vi har börjat prägla mynt för att undersöka vad för slags valuta vi har att göra med egentligen. Så att fiktionalisera blir en av flera metoder vi använder. Och det vi visade nu är stillbilder ur en film under arbete. Vi erbjuder också oss till ekosystemtjänstgöring. För det är väl inte bara naturen som ska stå för ekosystemtjänsterna, tänker vi. Här hjälper vi till på tillsammansodlingen Ola ihop på Södermalm i Stockholm och lär oss göra en 18-dagars kompost av Jenny Samson. Jenny är knuten till samlaboratoriet. Hon har lång erfarenhet av att initiera tillsammansodlingar, undervisa i permakultur och även väldigt kunnig jordbiologi. Och hon introducerar oss också till jordkromatografi, de här små runda eh, som ni ser på bilden uppe till höger. Det är ett sätt att visualisera och avläsa jorden visuellt för att kunna jämföra olika jordprover. Samtidigt som hon då deltar som Soil Sister i en filmning här där av klädsen. Vi föredrar att jobba med jord i vita skjortor ibland. Så det är några sätt eh, att känna jord och lära känna eh, jord och några av alla de människor som har engagerat sig i jordfrågor. Från gräsrötter, forskare, konstnärer till planerare och aktivister. Eh, och i Projektet som alltså precis startat så använder vi också platsbaserade undersökningar. Så vi kommer att utgå från några platser som fungerar som komplexa knutar kan man säga. Där många konflikter och berättelser, tider och relationer flätar samman. Eller snarare att vi vandrar mellan de här platserna för att se hur de hänger samman. För att komma ihåg det vi redan vet som Kristina Fredengren har, har uttryckt det. Vi tenderar att ha väldigt kort minne för det här är ju inga nya frågor. Förutom gipsa som vi visade tidigare här då som, som kan sägas stå som ett postindustriellt monument över framtidsoptimismen optimismens jordblindhet så besöker vi också Fågelsta med fokus då på boken Fred med jorden som skrevs 1940 av Elisabeth Tam och Elin Wägner. Och personer som Tam och Vägnar och Florigate var väldigt viktiga i den tidiga miljörörelsen i Sverige. De var pionjärer och de hade ett rikt internationellt nätverk. Och Tam och Gate de propagerar för och praktiserar också ekologiska jordbruksformer långt före sin tid. Och talar om mikrober och dagmaskar till och med redan på 1930- och 40-talet. Så de var sin tids Shiva kan man säga som... Som såg att mänskliga rättigheter, kvinnors ställning, ägandeformer, utbildning, eh, ja, rättvisefrågor, alla flödar samman i, i jordfrågan. Och de motsatte sig också tidigt konstgödslet. Och vi vandrar också mellan ingentingskogen och experimentalfältet. Ingentingskogen är en liten skärva av en tidigare väldigt vidsträckt skog. Med forntida gravar i ett område som en gång kallades för Solnö. Solna alltså. Och detta väldigt fragmenterade landskap har sett industrialisering, urbanisering, förtätning och exploatering i alla dess former. Och lantbrukarna som blev industriarbetare, de organiserade sig och höll kvar kontakten med jorden genom att bli kolonister. Och dryga ut matförrådet på arrenderad mark som ingen annan ville ha. 
längs järnvägarna till exempel. Experimentalfältet å andra sidan eh, försökte, ja, försökte ta fram nya former för jordbruk, då, nya växter, djurraser. Och den mekanisering och kemikalisering och industrialisering som skett i massiv skala de senaste hundra åren var det just experimentalfältet som lade grunden till i Sverige. Och landsbygden kan sägas ha transformerats från småskalig mångsysslarkultur till storskalig monokultur. Där boskap separerats från jordbruk som i sin tur separerats från skogsbruk. Och förändringarna ledde till mer och billigare mat, mindre slit och svält. Men också till att jordarna kraftigt har utarmats och eroderats. Och kretsloppen har brutit som också Stefano visade på. Det som tidigare var överskott blir ett problematiskt avfall. Djurgödsel kommer inte tillbaka till växterna och avloppslam i städerna kommer inte tillbaka till åkrarna. Så hur kan städerna ta ansvar för sitt jordberoende? Vi kommer att besöka några fler platser också. De namnger vi inte här men vi kommer att besöka jordägare och jordbrukare som kan ses som arvetagare till Fågelstad och möjliga experimentalfält 2.0 kan man säga där fred med jorden står i fokus. Agroforestry skulle kunna ses som ett nytt experimentalfält som Kristina kommer att berätta mer om. Sen, vilka är dagens tam och vägnar? Och på vägen mellan de här platserna så samlar vi också jordberättelser eller soil stories om människors relation till jord. Eller ibland obefintliga relation. Och här är vi i Malmö. Jag hoppades kunna visa en film nu men den dyker inte upp för mig. Tyvärr. Nej, jag kan inte spela den filmen tyvärr. Då hoppar vi över till nästa. Det var en film där eh, vi pressar jord eh, och gör jord, mynt. Så varje mynt här bär på en jordberättelse. Eh, och de gjorde då under den här jordfesten som vi arrangerar i Malmö och Lund i mitten av april. Vilket tar oss tillbaka till verket Fyra systrar för plantropocen som vi visade alldeles i början och det kan Malin få guida oss igenom. Mm. Precis, då är vi tillbaka i Malmö och den här utställningen pågår alltså till eh, 23 maj men Fyra systrar kommer att vara kvar under hela säsongen eh, tills den vilar till hösten någon gång. Eh, utställningen är en nordiska konstnär och amerikanska konstnärer och Titeln här på vårt verk, vårt samarbete, eh, utgår ifrån den klassiska samplanteringen Tre systrar som då består av majs, skors och böna. Och man då kan säga att hur de stödjer och hjälper varandra så är majsen den här stora systern som växer upp högt. Bönan får den som klätterstöd och kan klättra runt. Bönan är också en som är väldigt kväverik och ger mycket näring som både majsen och skorsen vill ha. Skorsen lägger sig vid fötterna och täcker jorden och behåller då fukter i marken, vilket de andra gillar. Eh, I sin bok Breeding Sweet Girl så skriver Robin Wall Kimmerer om de här tre systrarna. Men hon lägger även till och nämner att man skulle kunna prata om en fjärde syster också, människan. Och det Eh, landade då också i den här diskussionen om som utställning här Sustainable Societies. Hur ska vi jobba för ett hållbart samhälle? Eller, och det är ju vi människor <hör> eh, som är lite av problemet kanske. Att vi inte riktigt förstår hur vi ingår i ekosystemet faktiskt. Eh, så att hitta och förstå vår roll, människans roll. Eh, och hur vi kan bli en stödjande part för naturen istället för att bli den som plockar ut resurser från blev då en viktig del som ryms i titeln. Eh, det är alltså det vi vill sätta fokus på. Hur kan vi bli en fjärde syster och samspela med växterna? Eh, vi har också i titeln, eller titeln rymmer också då begreppet plantropocen eh, som Natasha Mayer då, som Janna får berätta lite kort om. Ja, hon är en antropolog, eh, Natasha Myers. Så hon har både ja, lite skämtsamt men också seriöst föreslagit begreppet plantropocen och erbjuder det då som citat A way of doing life in which people come to recognize their profound 
implication with plants. Så plantropocen är inte en ny era som antropocen. Notera att hon skriver scen som i teaterscen. Utan hon föreslår och, och leker med, med potentialen att som hon skriver då, stage both new scenes and new ways to see and even seed plant people involutions och uppmanar oss att alliera oss med de gröna varelserna. Och med involution så vill Majers uppmärksamma den ömsesidighet som binder växter och, och människor samman. Vi andas ju faktiskt genom varandra och blir till genom varandra och med hjälp av varandra. Uh, och hur, hur växter och människor både anpassar sig uh, och kultiverar varandra uh, blir extra tydligt uh, i en trädgård om med årstidernas växlingar. Att det inte bara är vi som kontrollerar planter utan vi förändrar liksom våra, uh, vårt sätt att agera och anpassa sig efter växternas behov. Så fyra systrar för plantropocen. Använda trädgården som en scen för att pröva relationer och synsätt till växter och jord som inte utgår från naturen som enbart en resurs. Så trädgården blir en omskolning, en skola, en mötesplats, en anhämtning men också ett väldigt handgripligt sätt att förstå komplexa relationer och system. Och det börjar då med gåvan. Och den här gåvan är en handfull frön. Så inne i museet så badar frön i ljud i väntan på att planteras ut senare i maj. Och det har visat sig vetenskapliga experiment faktiskt att ljud i frekvensomfånget runt 200 hertz hjälper just majsfrön att gro för att öka grobarheten på fröna. Så därför får de här fröna sällskap av en högtalare som förstärker just det frekvenserna. Majs avger faktiskt också ljud runt 200 hertz. Rötterna klickar och låter. Och rottrådarna söker sig också mot, eh, i riktningen mot 200 hertz. Um, och det som är speciellt med de här majsfröna i jämförelse med industriellt producerad majs är, som vi kanske är mest vana vid, då, de här gula vakuumförpackade grejerna i affären, är att de här fröna har vandrat från hand till jord, till hand i tusentals år. Och de bär på en enormt rik genetisk mångfald och är just resultatet av en biokultur, en människoväxtrelation som sträcker sig tillbaka mer än 6000 år, vilket för mig är wow, det är ödmjukande. Och jag fick de här fröna 2017 och sen dess har de växt i min koloni och de vandrar vidare som gåvor till andra och de har sitt ursprung i just en gåvoekonomi som, som Kimmer skriver om i, i Braiding Sweetgrass. Där människor, frön och jord är intimt förbundna med varandra. Och vi ser om nästa filmsnutt funkar då. Det gör den inte. Jag tänkte visa en kort film från installationen där man kunde höra lite av ljudet och se lite av filmen och sådär. Uh, filmen som projiceras i i huset inne i installationen har eh, filmats där majsen eh, har växt och följer platsen under fyra års tid. Men det kanske inte gör så mycket. Jag tänkte, jo men där kanske den kommer eller? Ja. Ja, jag tänkte att vi, så att vi höll tiden här så kanske det inte gör något. Vi hoppar vidare. För om vi nu började med gåvan inne på museet, eh, fröna ligger där och ljudbadar så är nästa eh, program eller om man ska säga då är ju bygget på gården och när man nu blir inbjuden till en utställning och gör en odlingsplats eh, på vintern eh, så är det, blir det också att eh, tänka på att ja, vad är det som händer i trädgården mellan januari och mars? Jo men då beskär man träd och buskar och kunde vi då i samarbete med Malmö stad få lite grenverk här då så skulle det bli ramverket för odlingsinstallationen på borgården. Så det här är då flätade ristaket som fick göra den ramen. Eh, du kan växla gärna. Eh, och sen så blir ju då också jorden grunden innan vi planterar ut växterna. 
Och där skulle vi ha haft ett publikt event på Borgården med inbjudna gäster. Bland annat då jordforskare Håkan Wallander. Även en hyllning till dagmasken, vikten av att vara dagmask. Men de här pandemirestriktionerna har gjort att vi har fått tänka om. Och i den här jordfästen har också då forskningsprojektet Humus Economicus bjudits in till museet eller till utställningen. Vi hade tänkt att vi skulle bjuda in stadens odlare till konstmuseets borgård för att då ge en jorddonation och prägla mynt. Men istället då så fick vi ge oss ut till dem eh, eftersom vi inte fick ha publika event. Men det blir ju ganska bra. Det, var också, det här var en hyllning till jorden vi ville göra men det var också en hyllning till de här odlarna, den fjärde människan som då de här odlarna i stan är, jordskötarna. Så vi gav oss ut på besök och här är vi i, hos Odla tillsammans i Brunshög i Lund som då är en odling som har varit där sedan 2012. Den rymmer odlingslotter på olika sätt, både familjer, en individuella kollektivodlingar. Det här är då som citatet här beskriver Sara Nils, Nelson här till hög, vänster högst upp i röd jacka är då en av initiativtagarna till den här och att det här är en väldigt fin jordbruksmark men här kommer nu, det här är deras sista odlingssäsong, här ska byggas och i bakgrunden kanske man inte ser här utan på nästa bild kanske så ser man då det här Max Plank, eller vad heter det, Max 4 och ESS någonstans där i bakgrunden, stora forskningsanläggningarna så det här, de ska få en ny odlingsplats i kunskapsparken men inte vara kvar på den här fina jorden då, för här ska det byggas. Här står Cecilia från en integrationsodling och pressa mynt ihop med filmteamet Part of the Biomass. Eh, Cecilia och tillsammans med Sara tror jag startade den här integrationsodlingen här 2015 när flyktingströmmen var så stor och just för att erbjuda en sysselsättning och mening för eh, asylsökande som var i ett litet limbo där eh, och skapa mening. Du kan bläddra vidare. Um, vi, till oh, Brunshög hit kom också villaodlare, det blev en uppsamlingsplats. Villaodlare Åsa här, vi hade faktiskt tur att vi har fått in olika typer av odlare runt om Malmö Lund. Ner till vänster där så är det Cyril som arbetar på Botildenborg och driver stadsbruk. Det är en av de, om man nu säger att vi, de här egenhushållen eller egna odlarna, mer amatör eller hobby, eller inte amatör men hobbyodlare, så är stadsbruk då en satsning på just gröna näringar eller att kunna, vill man nu bli grönsaksodlare så kan man då, de har både, erbjuder både utbildningar, se till att de hjälper till och stödjer för att kunna starta upp. Både Hildenborg driver massa olika projekt. Eh, det här är då en bit av marken. Om man nu går den här kursen med stadsbruk så är det 700 kvadratmeter att testa på. Är verkligen det här någonting för mig? Eh, ett år, en säsong. Är det intressant så kan de sen jobba vidare med att erbjuda 1500 kvadratmeter. Och så var han en sån entreprenör som räknar på att det här ska man då kunna ha 600 000 i budget och det ska kunna gå runt på de här 1500 kvadratmeterna. Malmö stad som stödjer det här har stött på Tillenborg och stadsbruk. Eh, är ju också, alltså som jag ser så har de ju då sett till att de får lokala matproducenter nära genom det här. I Stockholm har vi det lite det segare kanske, vi är inte riktigt, det är lite svårare. Vi besökte också här då är några kolonister eh, och även stadsodlare. Ner till höger är det stads, en av de första stadsodlingarna i Malmö, Enskiftesagen. Eh, citaten här var också faktiskt från någon då jag precis att diskutera. Vi ställde lite frågor, fick in deras lite rösterrelationer till jord men också varför de odlar. Eh, och det här är en intressant då, är det är det verkligen så att, ja precis, måste, måste det vara så att vi, att vi fortsätter flytta in till städerna? Ruralisering likväl som urbanisering att diskutera. Fortsätt. Brassa på lite kanske. Gärna. Ja. Det var ju flera som pratade om varför det här var viktigt. Alltså hur, hur började man odla eller hur börjar man uppmärksamma jorden? Hur blev jorden viktig? Och att det var i relationen, jag är ett arv, vad ska jag ge till mina barn? Eller som här Heather, hon driver en 
eh, guldängens bygglek och odlingsplats. En fantastisk plats där eh, barn då får komma i kontakt med det. Och för henne så var det det här matsvinnet att förstå att vi inte ska slänga så mycket mat. Eh, och att jag måste överföra den här kunskapen till barnen, till de yngre. Eh, hon pratade även om att det här med att lyssna på jorden och de hade en masskompost där också var att jorden blev läromästaren, pedagogen på något sätt, om man nu bara lyssnar. Vi är lite inspirerade av, bara backa kort där då, inspiration till en kompost på Accelerat, eller vad säger jag där, Skogsträdgården fin, fick vi här då genom Hedders fina och barnens fina kompostportal. Okej, okay. sen efter de här olika besöken, det var under en helg som vi var ute och mötte odlarna och samlade in och tryckte mynt eh, så, så ligger de nu tillbaka på borgården som en slags topsoillager på tillväxt innan nu växterna kommer att planteras ut under plantans skola i maj. Nästa bild eh, som då blir nästa programpunkt. Eh, där då de här tre systrarna nu har... Inte bara legat inne på museet utan nu är de nerstoppade i jorden och, och håller på att växa till sig och ska ut i odlingen nästa. Eh. Odlingsplatsen har då de här delarna med tre systrar som ett nav. Det blir en sittplats. Eh. Huset inne på museet kommer att flyttas ut på gården och fungera som både en boning för eh, den fjärde systern här som har finast mot t-shirts. Eh. Och... Eh, Kunskapsinformationsbank kan man väl säga. Eh, runt tre systrarna så växer då andra stödjande systrar fram. Och det är då mer inspirerat från skogsträdgården och fleråriga växter och även växter som kan vara eh, mer anpassade till det nordiska klimatet. Malen, jag ska ja. bara säga vi har två minuter till och sen vill vi ja. ta nästa. Ja men precis, jag tror vi är slutet på den här. Perfekt, tack. Eh, och exempel på stödjande växter kommer Kristina komma in på mer med havtornet och vallörten. Det kommer även kopplas ett skolprojekt i sommar här som konstnär Cecilia Wendt kommer att driva med småsyskon som då jobbar med att behålla det för vattensystem och kunna ta hand om det här. Fortsätt. Ja, och till hösten då en skördefest som vi hoppas får bli publikt. Men avsluta lite där med Robin Wall Kimmer igen. Eh, att det är ju inte bara maten, eh, alltså skörden och så, utan eh, vi hoppas då att, komma att, att kunna ha gäster och klorofyllbar och fokus på framtida mat, livsmedelsstrategier, men även få nya perspektiv på vad, kommun, vad växterna kommunicerar när vi äter. Och den är väldigt fin den här att Genom att vi äter dem, det är deras språk, liksom. deras sätt att kommunicera med oss. Och en sista avslutning, tillbaka till posten, Janna, så ska jag bara också tillbaka till den här fjärde systern som ju faktiskt är, vad, vad är det vi gör? Man ser att växterna, de är väldigt långsamma eh, och hur de rör sig och vad de lär oss. Och vår fördel är att vi är snabba, de är ju på en plats men vår fördel är att vi är snabba, vi kan röra på fötterna, vi kan springa efter vatten om det inte regnar, om det dröjer. Vi kan lägga på löv och kompost om vinden har blåst bort den och lämnat den bar. Och vi kan dela och sprida frön som kanske hamnat lite för tätt. Och vi springer fram och tillbaka hela tiden medan de andra systrarna står där och förankrar, växer samman, växer neråt och uppåt och fångar ljus och binder in kol och bygger de här nätverken. Deras utandning blir ju vår inandning och vår inandning blir deras utandning. Och där lämnar vi över till Kristina, tror jag. Men vi har ett litet, precis. Tack så mycket. Tack så mycket Malin och Jana. Det var fantastiskt. Um, jag delar min screen nu. Och vi börjar här. Mm, Okej, okay, kan du se den okej? Okay? Ja, super. 
Och välkommen hit då till den här trädgården som vi har anlagt på Stockholms universitet. Och platsen för det hela är det gamla experimentalfältet som anlades på i mitten av 1800-talet. Som var en del av det som var föregången till dagens, till dagens lantbruksuniversitet. Där man helt enkelt testade olika grödor och eh, odlingsmetoder och så. Och det är någonting så då som vi har tagit upp och fortsatt med. Och vi är då en, en sommarkurs i stadsodling som min institution, Naturgeografiska institutionen, har, har varit här sedan 2012. Och på den då så, ja, vi, förutom att vi har tillämpad odling så diskuterar vi Eh, viktiga samhällsutmaningar, eller vi allt från hållbar stadsutveckling, urban ekologi, hållbar livsmedelsförsörjning utifrån metoderna skogsträdgårdsodling som är en del av, som hör till agroforestryodling. Det ser från en vanlig trädgård eller vanlig odling, genom att man inte odlar i långa raka, gra, eh, långa, raka grader, mm. utan man kan säga att man odlar på höjden i mm. olika skikt. Mm. Så man har träd, trädskikt och buskskikt och markskikt mm. och kanske även då ett örtskikt och kanske klängväxter och så vidare. Och så vidare. Man kan säga upp till sju skikt, men här har vi förenklat det mot oss. Vi har trädskikt och buskskikt och, och örtskikt kan man säga. Det finns, många, det finns väldigt mycket som är, som är lovande med det här. Och, eh, dels så, om vi kopplar det här då till, till dagens liksom, problematik med, liksom, med alltså miljö, miljöfrågor som eh, klimatfrågan, eh, minskad biologisk mångfald till exempel och eh, utarmning av eh, jord, våra jordar. Så är liksom, eh, utifrån eh, jag ska säga, studier ifrån, ifrån, framförallt från andra länder och andra regioner i världen så, har man, så menar man att växande, växande träd och andra perenna grödor de binder in kol både i, sin, i, själva, i själva växten och sen framförallt i markskiktet där det som är mikoritsan, alltså det här nätverket av svamp och så som växer i symbios med som har, har, det är där också det finns väldigt mycket kol tror man. Vi ska säga, det har vi inte mätt här. Det är ytterst, det är ytterst alltså det är, ja, sofistikerade mätningar som krävs för det. Men det här är vad, man, vad, vi, vad vi tror i alla fall. Så det kan vara så. Eh, dessutom då så är det, eh, i, det ska det här gynna biologisk mångfald. Och en del av det är sund, sund förnuft. Om man tänker sig en, en, en renodlad monokultur. Det kanske bara är en, en gröda. Och då finns det också väldigt, dels är det ju grödorna i sig som är en mångfald. Så här är det, dels är det odlad mångfald av många, många olika arter. Och också olika typ av då, de här träd och buskar och skit. Men det här är också gynnar den, den, alltså den vilda biologiska mångfalden. För att det ger boplatser åt allt från små, äh, insekter och för äter för markorganismerna och därmed också kan småfåglar och så vidare hitta föda. Blommande växter gör att det gynnar pollinerare och så vidare. Så att det, det är både liksom den odlade mångfalden som är bra för den, för den, bil, den vilda mångfalden, tänk, tänker man sig. Och sen då är det liksom detta med att bygga upp jord. Och då så all, all, alla former av odling utarmar jorden på ett eller annat sätt eftersom vi skördar och tar ut. Det är därför vi då antingen så använder vi naturgödsel eller så pytsar vi på konstgödsel. Och det här systemet då är tänkt att inte, man ska inte tillföra några resurser utifrån på ett ungefär. Men istället så samodlar man med växter som kan eh, skapa den här näringen. Så en sån viktig, ett viktigt när, näringsämne är kväve till exempel. Och då sätter vi in kvävefixerande buskar här på, på, på ja, visst antal. Då. Så här är en mycket populär som växter. Här är havtorn. Mm. Mm. Och de är dessutom, då behöver man en, en, en hav och en hund. Okay. Okay. Men då är liksom ett, passar, dels har det ju då, kan, kan fixera kväve 
eh, och ger fantastiska eh, bär. Alltså nu idag i, i hälsosammanhang vi pratar om sådana här superbär och, mm. och sånt där. Och de, och de innehåller ju alltså, du, alltså otroligt mycket C-vitamin och även andra nytt, nyttigheter. Mm. 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 Och dessutom då så kan en sån här buske fungera som vindskydd. Mm. Och det här är både en ganska så blåsig och bullrig plats. Mm. Så att det är, så, det är, det är liksom den, den modellen man tänker liksom mångfunktionellt. Mm. Att en, 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 eh, det man planterar in ska inte bara ge en, en gröda man vill ha utan man vill ha andra saker också. Så man jobbar så då och försöker liksom koncentrera det här med att hitta så många funktioner som möjligt och i en samma växt. Det är så cool! <laughs> ja. um, och, uh, den här då som du har spist är också, en, är också en, en, är en, en av mina favoriter som inte är så känd mm-hmm. i vad ska man säga, vare sig butiker eller i matar Det är lite rosekvitta. Så den ger liksom, gula, små, runda, hårda frukter som hårda ganska sent. Och den kan man använda som, alltså den är känd, alltså man kan ha den i marmelad för den här in, innehåller väldigt mycket kristin så att den brukar bli såhär fast och liksom såhär stark ost och eh, rosenkvitten i en kombination. Mm-hmm. Men eh, att använda den här i matlagen som vi använder citrus till exempel så är det också en, då en, en, en möjlighet till liksom att hitta, hitta nya grödor som, som funkar att odla i Sverige då, så att vi inte behöver importera all, all, allting då från, som kanske också produceras med liksom, icke-miljövänliga eller människovänliga metoder och så. Så ja, den är den här rosen på rosa 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 den var lite. Mm. I alla fall så är det här spansk körväl. Det är en av de sakerna som kommer väldigt tidigt på våren och som um, smakar lite lempaniskt. Mm. Man kan äta hela växten. Den, den blir väldigt hög och får frön. Och kan man äta som små blåtrispastiller. Man kan gräva upp roten och använda den. Och det går att använda som en sallad och göra soppa på eller sånt i allting. Mm. Det här är... Jag fyllde Henrys molla, som är en liksom, ja, kassol eller skalatsläppning. Så alltså, här är en flinnare i spinat. Sen så kommer det eh, i fröställningarna här, så eh, de kan man, eh, antingen så kan man låta dem mogna eh, och skörda frön. Och då är de lite så här, som quinoa-liknande, liksom proteinrika frön. Men jag brukar skörda dem så här och ta dem och äta som primörer. Det är liksom lite som, vad ska man säga, som, lite som broccoli ungefär. Så jag tar dem med kolla mm. när de är tidiga. Mm. Och den här som sagt växer som ogräs och bland det mest ett, ett lätt ogräd man kan, man kan odla. Mm. Cool. Där vi är. Hej, jag ska låta den här. Cool. Vi kommer tillbaka igen. Okej. Okay. Um, vi ska prata. Hej, Kultivator. Också cool, ni är här. <laughs> vi ska bara prata som någon minuter till. Vi har som fem minuter. Och vi ska prata lite, um, och prata lite om, som, om skogsträdgården här. Och så vi har precis sett. Och lite som hur det är en ny experimental fältet här på Accelerator och SU. Och vi är så exalterade på den. Och det är Hummus Economicus. Du ska jobba med den trädgård. Um, så vill du säga lite någonting om den där collaboration och hur det, hur det ska funka? Ja, vi ser någonting. Ja, ja. 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 Eh, jo, nej men alltså eh, den här trädgården används ju eh, på vår, vår som, sommarkurs som bara är fem veckor varje sommar eh, och nu är det tyvärr uppehåll på grund av pandemin, man kan inte ha en praktisk skolning på distanskurs då. Men eh, det är ju, tanken är ju att platsen ska, ska kunna användas på 
på flera sätt. Gärna i, alltså det är ju en dröm att få samarbeta med, med konstnärer. Och jag tänker mig också att det finns en, en, ett projekt som vi har sökt pengar till. Det är alltså att använda trädgården, alltså för alla som både jobbar och studerar på universitetet som en, som en ute arbetsplats. Att göra den tillgänglig för alla en plats att vara på. För att ha möten och arbeta på och så. Och så kallar det, det kallas rest, restaurativa arbetsplatser heter det projektet. Men alltså att, att få till ett samarbete med konstnärer är i alla fall en, det är en dröm för mig sedan länge. Ska vi ta lite bara kort att vi också har, om man nu ser det så är det intressant med accelerator som vill jobba med konst och forskning och, och inte har mer än en liten parkeringsplats och gången där och den här ligger ju precis utanför. Och som Kristina då har beskrivit så är det nu, ja men nu är det kanske dags för en ny fas för den här trädgården. Den har varit den här skolträdgården. Och där var väl en idé från Humus Economicus. Skulle vi kunna ha den här som en, ett nav som, en start, som kan starta med komposten och maskarna flyttar in och så. En kompost finns inte där än. Eh, men en nav för samarbeten mellan olika organismer och så. Och samarbete mellan olika institutioner för platsen den ligger på eh, om det då är konsten men också andra delar av universitetet. Vi har faktiskt en liten som jag bara kastar ut som en sån här då, för det där projektet i Malmö Fyra systrar för plantropocen, den är ju på något sätt den, den blir ju temporär den nu för den är på den hårdgjorda gården även om den kan växa ut i ett mer långsiktigt projekt på andra former. Men vi ser ju fyra systrar för Plantropocen kanske mer som en modell. Eh, och, den skulle, och att vi också, jag menar jag har jobbat med Kristina här med, med skogsträdgården och med växter och så. Eh, med de metoderna. Eh, men här skulle det kunna vara en fyra systrar för, vi skapar Plantropocen, vi gör scenen. Skogsträdgården blir Plantropocen-scenen. Eh, och fyra systrar, för det är alltid ett problem. Vem ska driva och sköta den här? Var är de fyra systrarna? Men det skulle kunna vara studentföreningar eller olika. Ha en fyra systrars odlarförening på universitetsområdet. För det är hur man nu kan driva det här. Samtidigt så har vi nu också med Accelerator-restaurangen där. Tigo som skulle ha varit med här. Med sin gröna sörja och de torra löven som ligger i andra hörnan. Och hur vi hade kunnat sätta igång något. De är intresserade, det är ju en part som är nära som vill odla mat. <laughs> eller då... Att hitta samarbetspartner och få ett nav som man kan koppla. Kanske liknande det som vi har gjort med fyra systrar. Att också kunna koppla in aktiviteter och metoder och så. Men det behövs, det behövs ett tag och nya samarbetspartner och så. Men det är ett frö. Så tänker vi. Janne, vill du säga någonting till? Jag tycker Malin och Kristina sammanfattar det bra. Att, eh, eh, men just det här som också kultivator berättar så fantastiskt om i, i efter lunch där. Eh, hur konst och det här sättet att arbeta hela tiden väver relationen mellan det som finns på plats. Ser möjligheter vad som finns på plats. Det här mång, mångfunktionella tänket hela tiden. Eh, och som man också får en en känsla för när man jobbar med det sättet och odlar det mångfunktionellt. För det är så mycket som är sektorsinriktat och, och avgränsat i discipliner och kategorier. Och här får man praktisera vad det faktiskt innebär att tänka på det här integrativa sättet. Så det skulle vara fantastiskt att kunna använda skogsträdgården som en typ av grönt konstlabb för aktiviteter som löper över årets alla tolv månader där man kan följa de här cyklerna och olika faserna som både växter och människor behöver och göra det just till en plats för, för många. Det här har varit fantastiskt. Så det får vi jobba på. Du vill bara lägga till en sak som jag tycker att det här, att, att de här, att det här passar så bra ihop. Ert, ert, ert grepp då med fyra systrar, att människan är med. Det passar också som hand i handske med den typen av odlingssystem, alltså agroforestry, som jag är intresserad av. Där man alltid räknar med människan som en del av, av systemet. Liksom. Så det, är inte, det är inte separerat utan i, ihop. Och det tycker jag liksom har varit väldigt fint idag, både också från kultivator och från er andra. Att, man, att, att liksom 
påminna om den här relationen hela tiden mellan män, människa och natur och, och att du oftast att genom, genom, genom odling eller, det, eller det vi, om det nu är blommor eller är mat vi odlar så, så är det liksom det, det är ett väldigt ja, konkret sätt att att, att odla den relationen. Så, så, och det är någonting som just i, alltså, ur, ur, i våra i, ur, urbana människan har, har en längtan efter det här. Har jag, har jag märkt i alla fall. Absolut. Mm. Okej, okay. Malen vill du säga någonting sista? Och sen vi kan börja med vår sista prat. Eh, en, en till sån här fantastisk bara från Kimmerer som... som visar den här som du säger relationerna och olikheter. Hon beskriver två olika skap, två kvinnor och två trädgårdar eh, från två delar av världen. Där Eva och paradiset är den ena, vår civilisation där Eva ju faktiskt blir utkastad från trädgården och när jag läser den så blir det så här oj men det är redan där vi liksom separerar oss från naturen och pratar om kultur och natur som om vi inte ingår i naturen. Och sen så har den en annan om Skywoman eller där, där då människan är den sista som kommer in och måste lyssna, hon är verkligen lilla syster och måste lyssna på de som har varit här mycket längre vilket är växterna och lära oss ifrån dem och det visar på just den här relationen lite något som vi har glömt bort eh, att lyssna på de som har varit här längre mm. Absolut och det påminner sig lite om vad Jamila pratat om också med, med alla den intressanta vetenskap där mm. Okej okay, men tack så mycket till Kristina, Malen och Janna och ni ska alla stanna kvar. Now I'm going to shift into back into English, which is obviously a little bit easier for me. Um, and we are also joined by the worms. <laughs> But Kalle, who is doing a great job filming, do you want to try and flip it the other way? Because at the moment the worms are more horizontal than vertical. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. So we have cultivator who are now back outside again, which I think just looks much better, much more the way I usually speak to you. <laughs> um, and we have the worms here and we have all of our guests from previously as well. So welcome to the final session, um, which was called Final Words with the Worms. <laughs> um, and as I, as I you know, was trying to say in my quite poor Swedish, Um, there's, you know, there's this kind of beautiful relationship between this Gugstragården, this agroforestry garden that's right out the front here of Accelerator, and the ideas um, and themes of the experimental field. And they're really brought to life by the work that Cultivator has um, made for this commission. And this kind of, I hope what comes across is this circularity that we're kind of trying to set up here within Arden Research, that we have this kind of web Um, that we're hoping to contribute to and build together. Um, and for me, I think it's so much to do with being neighbors and finding ways of being neighbors to other um, species and to each other and how to kind of bring kindness and caring relationships to these neighbors. So um, I'm just going to, in speaking of neighbors, I'm just going to invite Stefano into the room as well. He's coming back to join us as well. Hi, Stefano. Hello, welcome back. Hi. Um, we're just starting off and we're just talking about how to kind of be neighborly. But um, we have about half an hour and I don't want to, you know, take up all the time with, with questions. But I do want to ask this kind of question about um, these new models that you're proposing in all your different kind of work. Um, you know, we've got these new models for how to do, how to run new institutions, how to have a new soil faculty or how to have a new soil bank or how to think about microbes as collaborators, these kind of things. So what do you think um, is the kind of potential um, or kind of possibilities that we can um, draw from with these new institutions? Why do we need them? Why are they important? And what do they offer? I know this is a huge question, but does anyone want to say a couple of lines or something about that? I can start and say, say something. Uh, for me, it's about uh, uh, the new, new uh, challenges for uh, for uh, our planet and for for humanity, uh, formulated uh, as the uh, this 17 uh, sustainable development 
and goals. They are try try to. It's an uh, attempt to to uh, for a more uh, uh, holistic uh, uh, approach or broad broad broader approach, which I, th I think is a good way. And if I'm talking about within academia, we uh, we need to do that as well. For for me, I, I'm I'm um, I would uh, I promote uh, inter and transdisciplinarity. And also to collaborate with the academia and uh, and uh, the rest of of society. So it's uh, for me, it's that's that's uh, that's a starting point that we need new new the new collaborations. I agree. Thank you. Marlene and Matu, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. Um, first of all, what wonderful presentations and what a great program you have been making, Romwin and. and Thanks, Your works has been great with the four sisters and 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 much more. Uh, yes, we think. I, as I said in the end of our, it's like two things. I think we have the institutions and the way we are working with these concepts is just also important because of the concepts. It's because it's important that we change uh, the way we see things, that we change perspective and that we realize this interwovenness with us and the other uh, life forms on earth that we start to just imagine to be collaborators instead of colonizers is a big step for us. We have really been brought up in a different way through many generations to start to kind of shift that and with the help of, of beautiful art projects like like the ones from um, Malin and, and Jana and Christina and with the help of research and also with the help of, of uh, weird uh, ideas as a black box becoming a faculty how could that be well in fact it contains so much knowledge more than we have in the whole university and I think it's about also making space like giving them an institute and not just this side partner or now that they are with us in the Zoom, they are there. You know, then you take them a bit more serious. So I think because we don't know where this really leads to partner up with them, we should partner up very seriously, give them institutions, give them uh, so that we are equal in, uh, in working together. And also let that change our language, I think. When, when you play around with language with the uh, humus faculty and we toy with humus economicus, we also try to find new ways of speaking about and um, uh, because language also, also forms new relations and, and practices. So it is a very serious play and a way to give space. Uh, uh, and, and try to adjust our language to the kind of knowledge that these engagement can give us instead of, of um, within art circles, there is also this da is, um, danger of, of academization or giving an academic language onto processes and engagement that has another way of of speaking and doing and relating. So we need to take care of language as well, how we speak about this thing. And also thinking about time, time or speed, time and speed. I'm thinking of that the tree has another time or the stone's time <laughs> is uh, at another speed than ours and so on. It's also important uh, to meet or try to understand the worms, for example. It's just popping up when we're talking so much about worms because I'm very close to worms, it has been since I was a kid. And then it was actually in a performance that Janna and Åsa Sedekvist, that actually was my highlight for one year ago that we five girls spending the Saturday evening being worms or trying to be worms. And uh, that was really, oh, Janna, maybe you could say something. Because this was very, you know, I, I, I couldn't uh, get out from that warmer body the next day, um, trying to, just listening and trying to imagine the warm life, but I'm still in my body. Oh, so. And maybe but, the, the one thing, sorry, please go ahead. 
So, I mean, the one thing I could I could add, maybe kids, child, our children are actually a good starting point to reconnect uh, people to soil organisms very much in general, earthworms, but also other microbial organisms, very small that we cannot see. Uh, in the end, uh, the, the, they will live on this planet as the next generation. So investing in uh, um, building uh, connections among the kids, I think, is very important. And, and there, I think, it becomes also natural to come up with a novel language because kids, uh, they have their own language and they can interact in ways that at least I cannot interact. They see things we don't see. So maybe that's also a lens through which we can discover new things as well. Exactly, Stefano. And I just point out, like with um, Emily Person's work that we watched in the digital break, she asked this question about when did you last taste soil? When did you last have soil and dirt in your mouth? And I think this really brings you back to the childlike perspective of, you know, you know, that we don't just have to learn and understand things through data and statistics or academic papers. We can also taste them and smell them and see them in these other ways. And um, I think that connection back to soil, back to our bodies in that way is really beautiful. Um, in, yeah. And also, and when, when Stefano and I first met, I was so drawn to the fact that you as a scientist had worked with children, because I think that's and sometimes a bit unusual. Again. Well, I guess because partly I am a child myself in a way. <laughs> yes. I think, Jana, did I cut you off? No? Oh, good. I think you have an important point there, Bronwyn, about this, yeah, using more senses than this language talking or writing, I think, uh, and remind me again about the Kimmer, this, that food speaks through the language of, that we eat them, or I also very fascinating about the, the actually this, the smell, the smelling. Uh, and how they communicate. That has actually been my COVID uh, last spring with my tomato plants. And they, you know, they communicate just if you go into the room, you have this smell, and then you feel, oh, I'm healthy today as well. Um, but it's a lot hidden in, in there, I think, and how, how they talk to us through the smell. We haven't recognized that enough yet, mm. I think. It's funny because yesterday, Marlon, when the first thing that you did when you came to visit the worms with the soil faculty is the first time that you've seen them installed since they left your farm. And then the first thing that you did was put your whole head in and say, <laughs> it smells so good in here. And you were, you know, you could tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's also a way to know very quickly if it's going good in the compost or if it's, it's, uh, rottening things but they they smell very nicely so uh, yeah they, they are they have been taken care of in a good way mm -hmm. we are very much looking forward to the projects that Kulbe is developing for the thing we are doing in the 20th of august in orlang and nature reservoirs and they are so bodily uh, so when we ask them you partner up with the biosphere they do that very bodily uh, in ways that yeah for me as a visual artist i feel really like oh this is a new language. Dance, anyways, a bit strange, that way, but they are really trying, and uh, yeah, it's very touching to see how they reach out to embody nature in a way. So. Absolutely, and Signe Johannesson's work with Kolbody will be, and um, Christina Fred and Green. So many, many, many connections in this web um, will be really beautiful. Um, I think it's on August. Oh, hang on, I don't have it in front of me. But it is coming up um, after summer, which will be really beautiful as well. But did, while we're talking about that, this kind of question about um, these kind of the potential of these kind of art and research collaborations, I don't want to run out of time. So would people like to say, like, where can we discover this potential in other locations? Or how can we, how can our audience take part in these kind of art and research projects that you're all working on? Where can we find you? Um, well, um, we, we try to, with uh, Humus Economicus, we, we try to post things 
on the website, but also due to the pandemic, we had to cancel all the public engagement <laughs> because we really wanted research and public engagement to go hand, hand in hand all the way through. Uh, but we will, uh, from next spring at least, be more active and available uh, and do things and seek out people and things like that. And people will be able to kind of be part of this um, coin making. Is that right? Yes, we we were planning to have a coin making uh, session, a soil celebration uh, this Sunday, uh, but we had to cancel that as well. The idea was that we started to build a compost in Skogsträdgården uh, uh, and we're doing this soil celebration to go out to different community gardens uh, to make coins and collect soil stories and also uh, donate these coins to the forest garden as a kind of soil bank. Uh, at the same time, a story bank, a relational bank, you could say. Uh, and by that also provide a home for, uh, for the worms from cultivators worms. Uh, but we, we had to, put that off and we will continue to build on the compost in, in the garden and we will continue to go out and meet people and make coins together. But we will also provide a kind of do-it-yourself kit so people can make their own coins, take photos of them and, and donate their stories to us because we, uh, we will continue or start rather with collecting different kinds of stories about human soil relations, about specific, very local soils and specific relations, because there's great power in, in stories and of sharing stories, uh, sharing seeds and st uh, sharing stories. So we would love to have your soil stories and we will take care of them and build a kind of soil story archive out of them, which is also a kind of mapping of living soils and living soil relations. So that's our plan for the coming four years. Uh, so at the website, there, there will, it's not now, but there will be uh, a kit and instructions for how you can make your own soils, soil coins. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Cultivata, would you like to talk a bit about some of your other upcoming things where we can find you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can you can find us quite soon uh, in August. That is already soon. You can find us in the project Explorations of Now in in Huddinge, and it's in Urlongens uh, Nature Reserve. And you could say that the work of of aiming to trying to change perspective, trying to collaborate with the biosphere, seeing yourself as something else is going on in this uh, project that we do together with the Kullberg Ensemble and the Institute for Future Studies. I think in that also that for me, at least, it's not that easy to work with researchers and artists. They are afraid to go on each other's fields. And also where I look mostly, I got today allowed that we are going to fill ditches to make uh, wetlands. And I think to have a third component so not only research and art, but a third component like kids, like actively really doing an effort for nature is going to make this communication possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm, besides fire talks that we will have, so not seminars, but talks around the fire uh, about our future, because it's a lot about like, how, how are we going to get busy? I think also it's very nice if scientists and artists will get busy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to leave both comfort zones uh, and then see what kind of conversations happen. Because often I think put them in the same room and it becomes quite quiet, but give them something to do and the conversations will flow. So hopefully in August uh, that will happen. Thank you. And you also run different residencies and things at, your, at the farm itself. Yes, we have a, a great other project coming up that is called M Other Futures. Where, some, where artists and uh, activists will come to the farm and investigate how the family, uh, in a larger sense, the family spanning over the more than human and the uh, um, whole, whole surrounding, what that can be. And that's a project that will then be 
also <laughs> brought further in these explorations of now that we have in Huddinge. So everything is in really in a process growing organically together from our farm and then up to Huddinge and to other places. So we, we are um, uh, busy and, and happy and like to jump from this great show of experimental felt that feels really it's energetic from this. That's nice to hear, Marlon. I agree. And Stefano, what about you in terms of at Stockholm University? Is there ways to engage with your research here or? Well, um, yeah, absolutely. It's very easy. Just email me. <laughs> That's the easiest way to, to get in touch and, and to learn more about what I do. I'm always happy to have a Zoom meeting or hopefully soon meet in person. And so as of now, actually, my research is becoming more theoretical rather than more applied, partly because of the funding we received. And that's how, how we, we do research. Uh, but also, we are hoping, uh, if the conditions allow, we are hoping to have a workshop in Vietnam to communicate the results from one of our projects uh, over there. Um, because one of my PhD students, uh, John Lipsy, actually discovered that what the farmers think about their soils in the Mekong Delta is actually quite wrong. So people are, are going in their wrong direction in the way they manage the land. They, they think that their uh, rice is um, nutrient limited, so they add more and more fertilizers. But that's not the case, most likely. So something else is going on. And, um, and we hope to be able to communicate this result. So for us, the next step in that project is really communicating and trying to get the farmers and the officers, the local officers engaged so that they can maybe implement alternative solutions or try something different, um, which is not easy at all. We'll see if we can make it. <laughs> Thank you, Stefano. That's super interesting. And Christina with a wonderful, um agroforestry garden is there a way for people to become more engaged with that or to volunteer uh, i hope so yeah so we're still in this uh, limbo by where the, yeah we can't gather gather uh, this this year but of course uh, i hope uh, uh, there will be uh, both more as, as i told said earlier i, I hope it will use will be used for for different purposes, for for gardening or for just uh, visiting as a working place, and uh, of course, I've, of course, as uh, this uh, uh, stage or scene uh, with uh, with uh, artists, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, I mean, for me, that would be a natural uh, next step for me is to just to to team up with uh, all of all of all of you. The, the worms, the worms, uh, and uh, the artists, and the researchers, and the accelerator, and and the garden, and the garden, uh, would be would be really nice. Sounds perfect. That mm -hmm. sounds really wonderful. We might actually finish up um, soonish, but if there is anything else anyone wanted to say or that we missed um, in this SOA symposium, any other thoughts? Final thoughts? No. Thank you all so very, very much for letting us try out these new experimental fields and really going, getting our hands dirty. Probably you can imagine the original plan for this soil symposium was that we would be in the garden getting our hands dirty and returning these beautiful worms um, or giving them their holiday kind of time. We we're kind of thinking of it, that they're going on their summer break now. So um, maybe we can just kind of imagine that that will happen it will happen probably tonight or tomorrow um and just to say thank you so much to the worms for all of the cultural work that they do for us um it's been such a pleasure having them here as our colleagues this term um and also i just want to say thank you to the hosts especially the two head hosts kalanyana who have been looking after them and we, when we checked it yesterday, everything has been it's very neat and beautiful in there. <laughs> the compost is very well maintained. So we've been really enjoying that relationship. So, yeah, the worms will, will go on holidays now and they will be um, delivered to the agroforestry garden tonight or tomorrow. Um, and in the meantime, thank you so much, artists. Thank you so much, researchers. Thank you so much, artistic researchers. I appreciate it so much. And thank you to the um, Accelerator team who are behind the scenes as well. 
um, Bert and Kalle especially, um, have magicked this together. Now run through the sun. Run out. <laughs> Come out of this dark room. <laughs> Thank you for hosting this. It's been a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for joining online. Thank you all. Yeah, goodbye, everyone. Ciao, ciao.